Some of you guys don't learn. We're here to celebrate Sting's retirement. And we still have people coming in talking shit about the show tonight, man. Clearly you didn't watch. Now, if you want to chat to me and Jesse, two ways to do that, man. Super chat or become a member, man. I don't know what to tell you. Maybe my mood will get better as the stream goes on and I'll take off members only. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, no fun and games. We're not going to sit here, bitch, moan, complain, criticize like we usually do on a weekly episode of Dynamite where the logic gaps are Vince McMahon-esque. Tony Khan is Mr. Pay-Per-View. Has he gotten all of them and knocked them out of the park? No. For AEW's first pay-per-view of the entire year, did he nail it? Let me tell you something, man. This guy showed up to the plate like Ronald Acuna and shoved that MVP up his ass and said, hold my beer, Ronald. AEW Revolution, by far the best revolution they've ever done. The best pay-per-view that AEW's ever done and maybe one of the best pay-per-views that I've personally ever purchased. Ladies and gentlemen, it's late. AEW killed it tonight. Tonight we celebrate. Tonight we talk professional wrestling in the OTS venue. And when I get there on this Monday morning, I want you to hold them up. And I'm gonna ask, what the fuck are you guys drinking? I'll see you over there. Why has Triple H been so successful? Why is Triple H running WWE better than Vince McMahon and Bruce Prichard on Monday and Friday night? Long-term booking. so very much for joining us right here on off the script this is your aew revolution 2024 post show i am your host jd from new york as always coming to you live from the ots venue thank you guys so very much for joining us on now your monday mornings wherever you may be as always Joined by my aew cohort on wednesdays the shy town smart Jesse himself. Brother, what's going on, man? What's 
going on, bruh? I don't know, man. I'm in a good mood tonight. The chat's not put me in a good mood. It's members wow. only tonight because uh, I see a lot of uh, disgruntled Fed fans, but, I mean, what else are you going to do, man, when AEW puts on a good show? Members That's only for now. Eh? Members only for I know. Members only for now. Uh, if I'm in a good mood, we'll uh, take it off and let the, uh, the, the peons come in here and uh, banter about with the VIPs. But if you guys want to chat, you guys know what to do. Become a member. Super chats are open, and uh, we'll figure it out as we get there. Jesse, tonight, um, I know you and I. Uh, this well, is second, bro, you got you to think about that. You got to let that sink in to people. A bunch of people paid a bunch of money to watch a pay-per-view. Yeah. Stayed up to the next day to go into a live stream. <laughs> just, just to talk shit about it. That's commitment, man. That is commitment. Oh, man. Give it up, man. Man. The venue's back, man. We got we to gotta, we gotta get a round of applause. Come on, people. That's commitment, man. Oh, they my They bought goodness, the pay-per-view. <laughs> Listen, man, then they're going to go on Google. They're going to go Google it, and then they're going to find out why they're $50 uh, in the hole. Right. Fucking ridiculous. I, mean, I love it. Anyway, um, I know. Uh, I said in the beginning, no fun and games. This is, uh, uh, I hope you guys get a, a great discussion here from two fans of AEW, from two fans of professional wrestling tonight. I know it's late. We thank you guys very much for joining us. At this hour, uh, I have things to do tomorrow. Otherwise, I'd be live tomorrow morning because I myself would like to watch the scrum or maybe get some sleep. But AEW uh, continues to put their shows on Sunday nights. I wish they'd move that back to Saturday. And we got a $100 Super Chat already. Love the energy, guys. It makes it uh, all worth a while for me and Jesse to stay up at this hour, man. It's 12 o'clock, my 12.30, my time, 11.30, his time. Phantom67 yeah. with a Canadian $100 super chat. Thank you, Sting, is all he says. And absolutely, thank you, Sting, is uh, the thing tonight, for sure. Thank you, Phantom67, for your generosity, and thank you for being here at this late hour. Uh, Jesse, I know you and I have been very open about our criticisms as of late of the AEW product. And I want to state here that you and I gave a very lengthy explanation as to why we say and do what we do on Wednesday nights, and it's not out of hatred or dislike for the company. Nah. Tonight, I'm not using tonight as, uh, oh my God, I'm raising the flag of AEW again, man. They're turning the corner. AEW is going to do what AEW does. Weekly television has been lacking. I'm not the only one who feels that way. Jesse's not the only one that feels that way. Plot holes, logic gaps, things that don't make sense, random matches, a slew of problems. But I will say this. I've said this and I coined the phrase Mr. Pay-Per-View, just like Monday Night Raw used to have Rob Van Dam call himself Mr. Monday Night or Mr. ECW, whatever the fuck he was calling, Mr. Wednesday Night, whatever. R uh, Tony Khan is Mr. Pay-Per-View. We know this because out of five years, I can't really think of more than a handful of pay-per-views that didn't deliver. Maybe two or three didn't deliver. The last one that I was actually part of was World's End. Didn't deliver. I just didn't feel the excitement, and I was physically there live. Man, he came out tonight, and the card was, from top to bottom, fucking unbelievable. I mean, on paper, you looked at this and you were like, well, this could be the best pay-per-view that, that AEW does for Revolution, for sure, right? Obviously, we got an amazing show tonight, and Tony Khan delivered on every aspect. No matter what we think about the overall product right now, every time they're on pay-per-view, they deliver. I will say this. This was probably the best Revolution that they've done in five years. This might have been the best pay-per-view that they've ever done. And, and I mean that. I mean, that, that's not... Uh, the, you, we usually say every time that uh, they always put on great shows. It's the best ever, best this, best that. But th truly, this might have been the best show that they've ever done. This might have been the, one of the best pay-per-views that I willingly spent money on. And they absolutely fucking killed tonight from top to bottom. This was the most perfect show that AEW has ever put on, in my honest opinion. I mean, it, it, it's hard to argue that. I don't want to dive into that because I'm going to be honest. I don't have a detailed recollection of all of the great ones that they've done. Yeah. 
it's easy to say this is the best one because it's the it's the freshest in our head, you know. But we need to pause, man. We're never gonna get through this shit because we have double bombs. Here. I'm telling you, man. I don't know. You guys come to the venue to drink and talk wrestling, man. I love it. I love it. Billy Sizane and Mr. Unknown with one hundred dollar super chats. Great pay per view. But I still have a major concern for Jay White being that he'll probably be fighting Okada and losing. What's next? More Ring of Honor tag team matches no one cares about. Would you like to see White under Triple H booking JD or should we be patient and see what Tony Khan does with him? Unknown. Normally, I read the, the Super Chats when they are $100 like that. We're going to get to that in a second because Jay White was on the pre-show. But we thank you for being here, Unknown. We'll get to that in a little bit. And Billy... He says, thank you, Sting. Thank you, J.D. and Jesse, for the IWC. I hope AEW turns the page and starts giving us better storylines now. Okada and Mercedes coming in. Don't fuck this up, TK. Thank you, Sting. What an amazing night. This is going to be a big month, Billy. Oh, my goodness. You guys are fucking killing me. We're never getting through this. Jesse's going to be up till 2. I'm going to be up till 4. It's crazy, man. Oh, my goodness. David Thiering with a $100 super chat. I tell you, man, when it's great shows like tonight, you guys are fucking excited, man. Thank you, David. If the haters can't take honesty, JD, then they shouldn't be in the venue at all. Of the wrestling podcasts and review shows that are out there, very, very few voice their opinions like you, JD, and I appreciate that. That's fucking comment in that right there, David. Thank you so very much. And I got a great comment from a fan yesterday at the House of Glory show that was similar to that one. Thank you, David, and thank you to all that are here tonight with us uh, talking AEW Revolution. Uh, like you were saying, Jesse, um, it's tough to uh, kind of recollect what uh, they've done in the past when comparing it to uh, a show like tonight. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's it's right here in our face. We're in that moment. We get the adrenaline going. You know, we just watched Darby try to kill himself. You know, Crazy. all that stuff is pumping. And I remember having this very same feeling for quite a few, you know, other pay-per-views, you know, so... It would take me to sit down and, and, and at least bruise through some highlights of other ones before I call this the best. But I feel safe in saying it is definitely one of the best they've ever done. I mean, yeah. it is it it's it, it, it a lot of feel goods, you know, yeah. um, especially as it pertains to Sting and everything else. Um, that whole that whole main event, I feel like everyone played their roles correctly. I mean. I complain a lot, you know, on my channel about um Matches being overbooked that doesn't need it and everything else. I need to make something clear. When I say a match is overbooked, um, it's not a it's not a complaint that matches shouldn't be overbooked. Most of the time, it's a complaint that this match didn't need all of that extra stuff. Um, this match, it all made sense. It played into the environment. It it felt good. I mean, it was good to see the legends get out there. I think it felt better to me because I know this is what Sting wanted, and it looks like. The match went off without a hitch the exact Bingo. way that Sting wanted it to. Bingo. And that's what makes me happy. Yeah. Uh, I normally would be in that same boat with you as far as uh, overbooked and just gone out there and just kind of did the unnecessary. But tonight, I put I put all that aside. Uh, I enjoyed the fuck out of what they did tonight. Um, and I said this, I guess, you know, de facto, we're going to start with that because obviously it was the biggest thing uh, of the entire night. You know, Tony Khan gets a lot of shit. Tony Khan, you know, I don't know what he thinks of what we do here, uh, specifically what I do. Uh, I have spoken to Tony Khan on and off about things that have happened on Dynamite. Uh, I'm not afraid to admit that. I've given him my opinions. I've voiced my concerns, and he's uh, addressed them, and we've talked about that uh, at times. And normally, we are very fair. Most of the time, we're very fair. And I think Tony Khan sometimes is treated unfairly. He does a lot of good. You know, yeah. he, also, he also has a handful of mistakes. He tries to correct those mistakes. Yeah. When Tony Khan realizes that the fans of his product don't like something, he's quick to fix it. The problem is it doesn't stay that way. He kind of falls back on his sword most of the time. Uh, yeah. But he always listens and he always corrects the mistakes that the fans call out. Normally, if it's terrible, uh, he will be there to fix and get back on track. He does get a, a lot of unfair criticism, and that's not Jesse and I, you know, fucking uh, slobbing his knob or anything like that. But with this sting, 
AEW venture, Jesse. Uh, I said this on social media today when I woke up, and it was one of the only tweets that I put out. If there's one thing in the history of AEW so far, and you can cite a lot of different things that he did right, I would probably say at the top of Tony Khan's list, the way he's used, the way he's maintained and honored Sting, the way he's used Sting, the way he's utilized Sting, how often he's used Sting without overexposing him, the matches that he's put Sting in, who he paired Sting up with, whether it's Darby or putting him in the ring with somebody, up till tonight via the Revolution main event, the presentation, the video package before the match, Metallica, Seek and Destroy, his son's coming out, honoring the uh, two different versions of Sting that we got uh, in, in his career. The match itself, the story of the match, why the match went the way that it did tonight with the story leading into it. Tony Khan booked Sting and treated Sting as perfect as anything in AEW's five years. Tony Khan, and I I feel, I don't know, I I wish he would come out and uh, I, I wish I could get his ear for like five minutes and ask him. I would love to know what his motivation was with Sting when he brought Sting into AEW. Was it... Was it a fact that he looked at the WWE run and said, fuck this shit, man. Sting doesn't deserve that. Let me get a hold of Sting. Let me treat Sting the way Sting deserves to be treated. And we're going to give everybody three years of a fucking memorable run that nobody's ever going to forget. I wonder how he used that WWE run that fucking failed miserably as influence to fucking get us to this point, man. And like I said, to go back on that point, Tony Khan booked and used Sting fucking perfectly from day one, bro. From the moment we heard that music that Mike Ruckus made, which was brilliant, up until tonight, man, Tony Khan deserves all the credit in the world for what he did for Steve Borden tonight. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I can't dispute that. We've we've said that from the get-go, you know, and that that Tony Khan has been booking the legends great. Yeah. And, you know, and that that was primarily, you know, just primarily because of the way that Sting was treated. You know, it did venture off into other legends, but it did kind of look like other legends booking didn't go as well. But Sting's booking from the moment he stepped through these doors to this moment here tonight, um, zero complaints. I'm sitting there trying to think of a complaint that we've had. I think one time we may have been like, my God, this guy's jumping off of every fixture and everything else. You know, Jesus Christ. But we don't see it very often. We didn't see him very often. He gets his breaks for a while, and he comes back, and it stays fresh and exciting, and he jump off some more shit, you know, and they'll do it again. Um, I enjoyed this run um, with Sting and AEW more than, clearly more than WWE, and I, I want to say pretty much more than anything he did in WCW after the initial NWO feud. I mean, after it got laying out of control, it was just, mundane yeah this was amazing this was an amazing way for sting to end his career it's memorable it's done right he looks like a beast and i don't think he could have asked for anything more no no he couldn't have asked for anything more i mean that man is going to go to sleep uh obviously uh in pain tonight after what he did with darby but in pain but with a smile on his face and uh you know, like I said earlier, Tony Khan deserves all the credit in the world for giving us not only this incredible show tonight and what will be an incredible month of March for AEW with Okada coming in and Mercedes Varnado coming in, uh, the former Sasha Banks. It is going to be an unbelievable year, and it's all going to kick off on Wednesday because Tony Khan's promised us a new logo, which we saw tonight as AEW announced a match already for Wednesday with Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher. And then they announced a new pay-per-view concept next, mo- uh, next month in April for, uh, I think, April 21 in St. Louis Dynasty. So the rumors of that are true. And we're getting a new set for Dynamite. So it's going to be an unbelievable. This, this was the launching point. He used this as a launching point tonight. But like I said, he gets a lot of shit. And some of it is deserved. But tonight, I don't think anybody should be really, be, be really looking at Tony Khan with those, eye, with those uh, sunglasses on or those eyeglasses on. I mean, he, he deserves all the credit in the world for what he did for Steve Borden tonight. And that was the most perfect way for Steve to go out tonight. And uh, I loved everything about it. I'm not a, I was never a big Sting guy. I was never a big Sting guy. I was always pro WWE. When I was in high school, I was always raising the WWE flag. Yeah. We, didn't have, we didn't have social media back then. All we had was fucking AOL and dial up you know we had chat rooms but we always uh you know were limited on how much 
online time that we could have. My parents didn't really let me on online for more than 30 minutes a night. Uh, but as far as my Sting recollection and going back on remembering things about Sting, you know, it's very tough for me to do that because I didn't watch TNA. I didn't watch WCW. I was strictly a WWF, WWE guy. So when I see this, it's like, man, I can't really join in on the discussion of those who really dove deep into the history of Sting. I yeah. know of Sting. I knew Sting. I know how important Sting was. But I didn't really get a good glimpse of Sting until maybe his main event mafia days, honestly. I, I knew of what he did, but when he when he reached that peak in TNA and he was doing that shit, and then he joined WWE, and then he joined AEW, that's when I really kind of... I don't want to say went back with Sting and kind of remembered what he did, but, you know, I followed him a little bit more closely when he was more in the public limelight, when he joined the WWE, if that makes any sense. And I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I should be ashamed to admit that, but, you know, I I, I didn't watch a lot of pro wrestling back in my, in my child. It was just strictly WWF, you know? So when I sit here and I see all these people talking about Sting and then we get what we get tonight, you know, it's not going to hit me like it would someone who's been through all 40 years of his ride. So to me, it's a little different, but I understand how important he was as a figure to pro wrestling. And to see everybody celebrate him was a beautiful thing because I love professional wrestling and we're all here because of Sting tonight. Yeah, man, it feels good. I was a, I was a big fan of WCW um, back in the day. I, I watched both um, around the, I think it was around the time um, right before I remember getting deep into the E right before WrestleMania 14. Um, I remember um, watching um, the Shawn Michaels Austin build yep. to WrestleMania. And I remember watching him hurt his back against The Undertaker at the Rumble that year. And then I started hearing, like, you know, little rumors that his back was really hurt. And then, like, yeah, bullshit. And then I saw he missed the February pay per view. I was like, uh, yeah, his back is fucked up. Yeah. But during that time, I was switching the channels back and forth, to WCW to you know, um, WWE, and when NWO was you know, running rough shot through the company, uh, Sting was just about the only one that never turned. Basically, man, he was the one guy that that, that refused to join. Um, at least the bad, you know, the bad NWO. The, the Wolfpack came as a different story, but um, fond memories of Sting, man. I mean, it just it it just childhood memories between him, Ric Flair, Dusty. Um, it was such it was a golden era of pro wrestling, man. There was pro wrestling and then there was the cartoon stuff in WWF at the time. That's why I didn't watch it. I wasn't a fan of the um of the 80s era, you know. It was golden era, I think it was it's called. Yeah. But um the attitude era, I I was two feet in. Um, but I didn't stop watching WCW. So I was a fan of both, man. And it was good. That was the the best time of pro wrestling. I mean, uh, everybody will agree that the attitude era was the best. It was the same for WCW as well. Yeah, I know. Uh, the thing is, with my childhood, the way the, the way my parents raised me, uh, I was only a, allowed to watch one. So uh, for everybody <laughs> in the chat asking, I, I missed iconic Sting moments. Yeah, you know, um, when I got to high school, you know, my parents didn't really allow us to stay up that late. You know, they only allowed us to watch TV if and when we did our homework and. Monday Night Raw at that time was going on at 9 o'clock, and it ended at 11. They didn't allow us to stay up that late. And all through that period, you know, I was only allowed to watch one, and it was on my parents' big screen TV in the living room, and they wanted us out as soon as possible so that they could w watch what they wanted. And we had to watch two hours of pro wrestling with them. So it's like I couldn't even watch it on my own volition, and I was basically stuck with WWE, and I had to hear about WCW from – people in school the next morning about how great it was and this and that. And I only had WWF to go on. So th there's a reason why I didn't uh, kind of dive into WCW during the heyday, during the Monday Night Wars. Uh, and, and that's the reason. It's just basically my parents didn't allow us to watch that. But, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. The Attitude Era was, uh, you know, the, the fondest memory of most of us here. You know, yeah. what, what Sting did with the NWO and that whole angle and, you know, yeah. Him doing that and basically being the savior of WCW. Yes, I, I, I vividly remember that for sure because I did obviously go back and kind of relive some of that stuff uh, when yeah. I got older. But, yeah, I mean, Tony Khan, he, he nailed it tonight. And uh, I don't think Steve Borden could have asked the three, the, the three years he's gotten here from AEW. Fucking perfect. I, I love it. We're going to talk about the match. We're going to talk about the, uh, the fucking near-death experience that Darby Allen had tonight. Uh, Sting almost had a fucking near-death experience a couple of times. Yeah. Tonight, uh, he said he was going to go out, 
with a bang, and he did that. So we will get into that. Also, we will talk about what I thought was a fantastic triple threat match with Samoa Joe, Swerve Strickland, and Adam Page. We got news on Adam Page and his behavior tonight. There's a reason why he did what he did tonight. Uh, and Feifel, away, like I said. Feifel has a report on it. We'll get into that. We'll talk about Will Ospreay and give our candid opinion on Will Ospreay. The match of the year up until this point. I don't give a shit what happened anywhere else. Will Ospreay and Konosuke Takeshita should be two of the men in this company from this point on that Tony Khan gives that fucking ball to and he does not let them drop it at all. Don't take it away from them. Ridiculous, unbelievable match tonight that will go down at the end of the year as maybe the best match of the year. So we'll talk about by, that. By the way, if so, real quick, if so, if you guys are, you know, um, younger and a part of this, you know, uh, these X or millennials or whatever the fuck generations and you weren't alive yet to hear the good times and memories we're talking about with Sting and then the Attitude Era. Instead of trying to go back and watch, you know, 15, 20 years of wrestling, um, I'm going to suggest something to you guys. Go to the network, um, Peacock, and watch the whole series of the Monday Night Wars. That is a fantastic recap of the glory days of the Attitude Era that you keep hearing about and you don't know where to watch and you can't watch it all. Just go watch that documentary from beginning to end, and that's a pretty good recap of the, uh, the, the Monday Night Wars right there. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great documentary. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, like I said, guys, we'll talk about Osprey Takeshita. We'll talk about Kyle O'Reilly is back in AEW. How soon he's going to be involved, I don't know. But he is not in the undisputed kingdom as of yet. Adam Cole came back tonight. He walked or uh, wheeled out with Wardlow. Wardlow won the all-star Denny Scramble match tonight. We'll talk about that. That was uh, pretty predictable, but it's going to be interesting to see where they go with that as he is now the number one contender. Orange Cassidy lost that international championship to Roderick Strong tonight, as he should. And Brian Danielson, Eddie Kingston put on their best match to date in an AEW ring. Unbelievable stuff from both of those guys. We got a lot to talk about. And yes, we will talk about the pre-show and Jay White. Thank you guys very much for joining us. And we got another bomb here. Steven Brewer with a $100 Super Chat. Thank you, Sting, for being one of a handful of wrestlers who made me a lifelong wrestling fan. Sting is on my Mount Rushmore for capturing my imagination as a child. Thank you, J.D., Jesse, and Drew for giving us great streams. Steven, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you. And Cy Richards with a $49.99 Super Chat. I'm going to read size Super Chat here. From fourth grade to nearly AARP. Super fan from first match to last, surfer to crow. It's been an amazing ride. Hashtag thank you, Sting. So, obviously, Sting has lifelong supporters here from the OTS side of things, and I really appreciate you guys joining us here on the streams this evening. Follow us on social media, at JD from NY206, quickly. That's X. And then Jesse is at Shy Town Smart on X as well. Also, I am on Instagram, TikTok, and Cameo. Make sure you guys go hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for notifications. We are already at 725 likes. I'd love to get to 1,000 tonight to remember Sting's great 40-year career. Super Chats are open. You guys are already killing it, man. Thank you so very much for being here and celebrating with us. Memberships are open. If you guys want to chat, become a member. We already got 10 new members already. Unbelievable. Thank you guys very much. If you guys want to go subscribe to Jesse's YouTube channel, link is at the top of the description. Just click his name. It'll take you right to his YouTube channel. If you guys are on the stream. If you guys are listening on the iTunes side of things, iTunes, Spotify, and all other major audio platforms, thank you very much. Make sure you guys go and leave a five-star rating over there. It helps us out. And moves us up the charts, man. We'd like to get closer to the top 10 if we could. So thank you guys over there. And please go check out all the other content on the channel. There is plenty of it. With more coming tomorrow as I will be live with Monday Night Raw. 
What will Cody Rhodes have to say in regards to Dwayne's unbelievable Friday where he cut 30 minutes of promo and he absolutely buried Cody and Seth Rollins along the way, man. We will talk about that on Monday, hopefully on the Raw Post Show. Bro. Yes, sir. Check out the penthouse condo overlooking Lakeshore Drive, sir. Oh, is that where you are now? You moved out of the venue. Right? You don't want you don't want to work in the venue anymore. No, nah, man. I was I was having my construction done. I can go ahead and move out. Move into my own dish. So who man. the fuck is bartending over here? Uh, I, I I couldn't tell you, bro. Couldn't I don't know, you. man. I don't know. East is not in the chat anymore. She's not bartending. You're not here. Who the fuck's gonna bartend? I don't know, man. But these digs are off. That's the merchandise mart right here. Listen, any pretty ladies, send in your applications. I will thoroughly review them and we'll get you a job at the venue. Clearly, Jesse is uh, failing me, and we need, some, uh, we need some new talent here. Come on. <laughs> anyway, the zero-hour pre-show, Jesse. Did you watch the zero-hour pre-show tonight? Yeah, I think so. I kind of tuned in a little bit here and there while I was waiting for my dinner to arrive and stuff, man. I was hanging out. But... So we got the acclaimed Anthony Bowens, Max Caster. Daddy Ass, Billy Gunn, Switchblade, Jay White, Austin, and Colton Gunn against Jeff Jarrett, Jay Lethal, Satnam Singh. Yes, he wrestled. Private Party, Isaiah Cassidy, Mark Quinn. Don't know what the fuck they're doing with them, but okay. And Willie Mack. Don't know what Willie's doing with them either, but okay. Karen Jarrett and Sanjay Dutt were on the outside. Standard uh, Jarrett and crew match. Standard... Zero hour pre pre show match. Uh, the acclaimed win here along with Bullet Club Gold. Jay White pinned Willie Mack with a uh, Blade Runner, or uh, I think that's what he finished him off with. He finished him off with his Blade Runner, and uh, that was basically it there for the Bang Bang Scissor Gang. This has been a topic of discussion for 24 hours since this match was made. I don't know why the fuck this match was made. You got AEW elitists. You know, basically chiming in. Oh, it's a pre-show. Why, why do you need to complain? Because Jay White doesn't belong on the fucking pre-show. That's why. Number one. Number two, the reason I came up with, Jesse, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, didn't the Undisputed Kingdom under the masks, wearing the devil masks, didn't they throw the acclaimed through real glass? Shouldn't these guys be targeting the Undisputed Kingdom here? That's the second reason. And number three, Jay White shouldn't be on the fucking pre-show. <laughs> so spare me your complaints. Um, Jay White's going to be fine. But it looks like, Jesse, if you've been paying attention to social media, Max Caster, uncharacteristically, has been fucking up his raps. What do you think this means? All right. First off, uh, he botched the first one, okay? <laughs> you the think he time. botched the first one and then he... they turned it into a storyline? Yes. <laughs> yes. He botched the first one. It happens, okay? It fucking happens. You can ignore it and keep going or pretend it never happened. Or I think they chose actually the best route. Just make a storyline out of it. You know, why fucking not, dude? I mean, it, it makes sense. I mean, it gives him something fresh to do. Yeah. I got to tell you, Max Caster botching his fucking his, his entrance raps is the most interesting thing the Acclaim has done in months. And that's sad. That's fucking sad. These guys are talented. They should be reigning tag team champions, you know? I mean, but I, I don't know. I mean, and, and, and they can't do anything but bang, bang, scissor gang and everything. I, I, I don't know. But him, him botching his raps is actually interesting because it feels like it's leading to maybe a different entrance or something like that. I mean, or something of interest because right now the claim is just ice cold. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where they go. Obviously, this is leading to a split, but I mean, it's dragged on for so long, and I think we're all kind of tired of this. Bullet Club Gold was fucking hot, and, and ever since Juice Robinson went down, it's almost as if they didn't know how to book them anymore as a trio, but as a foursome, yeah. they were fucking great, and, and I, I genuinely miss Juice's presence with the group. I, he just adds a whole different dynamic to the group, and I think he plays off Jay White very well, and Jay White plays off of him very well. The guns are great, don't get me yeah. wrong, but the guns have charisma, but it's not the same type of charisma as Juice Robinson, so I think that aspect of the group is missing. But as far as Jay White is concerned, 
Yes, this is leading to a split. I'm sure the Bullet Club guys are going to stay heel. The acclaimed are going to stay babyface. And there's going to be some sort of trios championship match along the way. But it's taking us a long time to get here. And people are now starting to ask questions. Which yeah. is why I think Jay White cut this promo after the match. He did some mic work after the match and said, Greenboro, you know, uh, you're in for a great show tonight. He basically was the hype man for the show tonight. Um, he then said that they are the greatest faction in pro wrestling. No, they're not. Uh, the Bang Bang Scissor Gang. No. Uh, he said, on any given day, at any moment, he can remind everyone what made him the catalyst of pro wrestling and remind everyone what it's like to breathe with the switchblade. So if you don't think Jay White is listening to the murmurs online, you are mistaken. He said, in 10 days in Boston, maybe he'll handle some big business of his own. Now, this is very interesting that he gave everybody that little tease, Jesse. The rumor is either Okada on Wednesday, that we get Okada on Wednesday and it sets up a match for the following week, Wednesday, in Boston. Or we get Jay White confronting Okada when he makes his debut in Boston in two weeks. But he teased some big business. And the other name, obviously, is Mercedes Varnado, Mercedes Monet, coming in. He's clearly not feuding with her. So the other uh, rainmaker is uh, Okada, and it looks like we may be headed for a Jay White Okada feud in AEW, which I wouldn't mind, but uh, Jay White really isn't going to come out on the winning end of that one if that's the direction there. Yeah, no, I, I saw the super chat earlier. It said, no, now nah, he's going to probably go and face Okada and lose to Okada. Let me tell you something, man. Losing to Okada is 100 times better than doing the bang bang scissor game. Okay. <laughs> I would lose to really Okada now, man. every you pull my week. leg on that one, man. <laughs> every week I'll lose to Okada, okay? And I'm not out there scissoring with daddy ass. Uh, it, it, it's, it's so fucking Listen, lame. it beats be, be, it beats being in the ring with fucking Satnam Singh, okay? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll, I'll gladly lay down for one of the best pro wrestlers of this generation, okay? That's not a not a complaint that I'll have because right now He's going down the fucking toilet. You know, we made fun of the people who were screaming that Jay White was buried and everything else. We made fun of him because at the time he was not buried, okay? Yeah. But now they're just kind of making that shit come to fruition, dude. This is this is just beneath him. Everything yeah. he's doing is fucking beneath him. Yeah. He's on the pre-show for their biggest pay-per-view ever. Uh, he is holding titles that don't matter. And he's been relegated to scissor with... The acclaimed. Meanwhile, he was in the Continental Classic. He was in the finals of his block. He was holding the AW Championship hostage uh, while MJF was parading around trying to get it back. He was in the main event with MJF in full gear, and they delivered a great match. Like, what the fuck happened? It's like, he, he, he's here, and then the Continental Classic happens, and then he just fucking falls off a cliff. That's what people are taking notice of. And if you don't think that's a problem, and you're using the excuse of, oh, well, it's leading to a feud. Nobody asked for the fucking feud to begin with. And why is it taking so long to get there? And why is he holding titles that don't matter? That's the problem. Yeah. Stop making excuses for bad television. Shea yeah. White. Shea White was in WWE right now, and I don't want to mention them on a fucking AEW show, but I am. The guy would probably be in top contention to wrestle, to wrestle Seth Rollins for the world title at WrestleMania. Yeah, he's Maybe. in the fucking Bang Bang Scissor Gang. Come on, guys. Maybe. I heard that Trinity just got squashed by Tiffany Stratton in three minutes. Listen, so. Tiffany didn't Maybe. get an entrance. Maybe. Tiffany did not get an entrance either, okay? Maybe. I'm just saying. We're talking about, I was talking about her coming back and joining the fucking bloodline. She's jobbing. No, cut her oh, segment. Oh, just jo fucking jo cut her jo segment. Jo jobbing to Tiffany Stratton is not jobbing, dude. It is when you're Trinity. Would, you, would Charlotte be taking that L? No. No. Why not? No, that's not in her vocabulary, man. She's not, she's not, not? She's not programmed with that letter in her database. No. I'm sorry. Would, would Becky be laying down like that in three minutes to Tiffany Stratton? Well, Becky should have lost to Tiffany, but Taff uh, uh, Becky was the one who took the title from Tiffany, so no. So why are we doing it to Trinity? I don't know. Is it because she left and they're still bitter? Probably. Yeah, thought so. New administration, same <laughs> mindset, bro. Come on, you know, you know the deal. But we digress. Yes. Yes, we, uh, Jay White's going to be fine. It's just uh, people are starting to talk online, and uh, 
Looks like the wheels are slowly in motion here, so hopefully he uh, gets his way out of it. Julia Hart, she teamed with Sky Blue against Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander on the Zero Hour pre-show. This was the uh, other match. There were only two matches on the Zero Hour pre-show. This was okay. Uh, I'm a fan of all of these ladies. Um, Julia Hart and Sky Blue, more importantly, uh, we're bigger fans of them. Chris Statlander's great as well. We love Stat. But um, the match itself, Jesse, I mean, it was uh, it was okay. Uh, I think these ladies, they've kind of mixed it up as of late. And we got uh, a decent match. I believe Sky Blue wrestled Stat on Dynamite, didn't she? Didn't, didn't she wrestle uh, Stat? I don't know if it was. I'm, I'm, I'm sure she's wrestled Stat. Yeah, and it's been times. yeah, it's <laughs> been it's been it's been good. Yeah. And Sky Blue has uh, really gotten herself uh, in, in a good position in the company. Julia Hart has had some very good performances, minus the Abaddon one. Um, these ladies know how to work. I didn't think this match was all that. For the zero hour pre show, I'm glad that they actually got a, a match with them on the show. But you know, Willow and Stat win. Statlander landed some double lariats on both Julia and Sky Blue. Tag Willow back in. Willow gave Sky Blue a Keith Lee like Adam Cole pounce. She followed a sit out power bomb for the one, two, three, and Stokely was thrilled and uh, celebrated with his ladies. You say Stat's going going heel here? You, you still feel that? Oh yeah, yeah. for sure, man. I for sure. I, I feel like they're gonna keep running that angle of Stokely wants to be a little snivel, a little sniveling, little you know heel, and that's just not in in Willow's demeanor. That's just not within her at all. Yeah. Um. But I think Stats are gonna come around to it because she wants to get back into the championship gold contention, and I think she's gonna believe that Stokely can get her there, and it's gonna start with Willow. Uh. I think this is brilliant. I think this is brilliant. Um, I hope this is the way that they're going because Stat going heel with Stokely and then feuding with Willow and then becoming full blown heel, I think is absolute money. You you can go ahead and do that feud with them, um, blow that one off, and then you can decide which direction you want to go with Stat, whether it is towards Tony Storm or if it's uh, towards Julia Hart. So I'm loving it. How are we feeling about that TBS championship? Are we uh, keeping that thing on Julia or when Mercedes comes in, are we putting that uh, title in a spotlight bigger than where it is now? It can, it can go to a spotlight. I have no, I would be not, a, not opposed at all to Julia having a high profile match with Mercedes and losing it to her. Um, I would just, I, I ho I'm hoping that Julia can, you know, make sure she gets a full recovery from this injury. Because I do believe that's why she's on a pre-show and in a tag match to kind of just protect her a little bit. Yep. Um, and just get her get her momentum back going a little bit. Then absolutely, man. Get her in the ring with with uh, Mercedes and get some gold around Mercedes, and that'd be fantastic. Yeah. So we'll see what happens with those ladies. Obviously, that storyline is continuing, and uh, Julia Hart still the TBS champion. We will hopefully see her in action defending that title against uh, somebody soon. Uh, the actual pay-per-view started off with Christian Cage defending the TNT Championship against Daniel Garcia. We were under the impression that we, before this show, during the build, we were going to get another match between Christian Cage and Adam Copeland for the TNT Championship. It was midway through this match where I said, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Adam Copeland in this match and he interferes to help Danny Garcia win the TNT title. Now, you could go either way with that. One, uh, the crowd would have absolutely erupted for Danny Garcia winning the TNT championship. But on the other hand, Christian Cage shouldn't be losing the championship. And I don't think there are a lot of people right now who would take the title off of him. Because if the title goes to anybody else, I just fear that Tony Khan would make it just like the international championship, and it would fall right back into the fucking pit that it was in before Christian won it, where it was defended on weekly television with absolutely no rhyme or reason. So I'm glad that he still holds the championship, but man, oh man, I would be lying to you if down the stretch of this match, when Danny Garcia had a couple of those near falls, man, and the crowd erupted, I would be lying to you if I told you I didn't want him to win the championship tonight for at least a split second. No, yeah, I had, I had, I so I had the match going on, um, the way it was gonna go on, and I, I had Copeland coming out to attack after the match. You know, I figured, you know, Copeland said I'm not gonna get involved in Garcia's opportunity. You know, that that's up to him. Even though there was other interference, I'm just gonna let him do him, 
And if Christian should happen to come out victorious, I'm going to go out there and kick his ass. So I was expecting him to come out after the match because I don't, I don't see anyone taking that title from Christian except Copeland. So um, that's why I knew Garcia was not going to win. But um, I did kind of hope he was going to come out after the fact he did not. Um, are we looking at an injury with him right now? With Adam Copeland? I don't yeah. think so. I, I don't think so. I think they're really just playing up the concerto uh, okay. and uh, that being delivered to him when it when it happened uh, two weeks ago. So I don't think he's injured. I, I, think, I think they want to space out. This is just me just spewing off the top of my head. I, I think that they want to space out the matches and they want to really kind of take their time with getting to the next couple of pages in this chapter before we move on full-fledged to the next chapter. You can kind of see where it's probably going to end up going, but I wouldn't mind Adam Colpin winning the TNT championship because he would be just like Christian Cage holding that championship, and he would bring great value to the title and, and take the title off of Christian and do exactly what Christian has done with the championship for the months that he's held it. If you put it on somebody like Danny Garcia, which would have been great tonight, but it would would it would would have been just a moment tonight. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like it would fall back into the uh, fucking uh, hey, let's put this uh, title on the line against some CMLL fucking random on rampage. Nobody nobody wants that. So yeah. I do think that Copeland and Christian are probably headed towards a match at double or nothing, and it could be the final match between them before we move on to the next chapter. And Copeland is the new champion at that point. I I would not mind that. I really wouldn't. Yeah, no, that'd be that'd be fantastic, man. Um, that, and that's that's what I kind of figured that Garcia just wasn't going to win. I mean, I knew he'd give us a fantastic match and all, but I don't see anyone beating Christian for that title except um, Adam Copeland. No, right uh, the chat is just uh, letting us know right now that Tony Khan just announced Darby Allen versus Jay White at Big Business in Boston. There you go, first time ever. Look at that, man! Looking there better go. already. There you go. You don't think you don't think he's listening to the social media whispers online? Come on. And why would he pull Jay White out of his, you know, six man bang bang scissor gang bullshit out of the blue? For this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, this was a very good match. I thought this was uh the only thing the only thing I would say about this show, Jesse, and I don't I'm curious to know what you thought. The match order was to me a little out of whack. I would have absolutely started with Osprey and Takeshita. I would have started the show with that because the way they placed it, Osprey and Takeshita were happened, and then they followed with the AW World Championship match, which I, I, I was saying to myself, I don't know how the fuck anybody's going to follow this, and Swerves, Joe, and Hangman are fucking fantastic. They even struggled to follow that match. I don't know no, if you, you felt that same that way. On first. You got to have the whole fucking card follow that. <laughs> fucking crazy. This show's all downhill from there. <laughs> no. Are you fucking nuts? I don't know, man. You would have had Brian and Kingston follow it, man. That was great, too. This show is a match of the year candidate. The show is all downhill after the first match, bro. At least put it on in the first hour of that. I mean, holy shit. Don't put it on before the the, the world championship match. Like, who the fuck's going to follow that? Hey, man. Swerve and Joe and Hangman followed that perfectly fine. I was not taken about i was not like oh god this now i wasn't bored by it they did perfectly yeah. fine they had a lot going on to follow a match like that yeah this and, was and that's, and that's usually i'm sorry to cut you that's usually the key to following a a, a fucking potential five-star match like that when it's in ring work the best way to follow it is a match with a lot of story behind it so that you don't have to match the in ring work that you just you know that you just saw your story is going to come into play. And there was a lot of story in that, in that title match. So I think it was a great placement right there. Yeah. Uh, this was a very good TNT title match. Uh, Danny Garcia, uh, I've uh, grown to appreciate him a little bit more over the last uh, several months. I think uh, I'm warming up to him in the gimmick that he plays. I didn't really see him in the championship match during the build. I thought they were simply going to go to Copeland. Or, or maybe give us a triple threat match, but they went with Danny Garcia, and it looks like they're saving Colpin for a later date, but this was a very good match, a great way to kick off the show. The numbers game came into play here against Danny Garcia, so he had to battle all of the patriarchy out here, and he only had Matt Menard to basically back him up. Nick Wayne charged in here, and Garcia dodged him, sending him into the ring announcer's table before fighting off Cage to get back into the ring. Garcia... 
back in the ring, connected on a flying clothesline. He pulled Cage's shirt over his head and started delivering the 10 corner punches, and then he did his signature dance right in front of Christian's face. Obviously, he still had his shirt covering his face. We got a dragon screw out of the corner here, and Garcia tried to go for several pinfalls here, netting himself several near falls. Cage got in a body shot, tried to slingshot uh, his uh, right hand, but his leg gave away, and he worked on Garcia. Cage was in the ring, and he was begging off an attack from Danny Garcia, but he managed to reverse DDT for a two. Garcia avoided a frog splash, turned it into an ankle lock. Cage again rolled out, but was planted with a stalling back suplex. Cage answered by slingshotting Garcia into the corner, and Cage took the referee to distract the referee here, and Kill Switch finally gets involved and hits a choke slam from the apron into the ring on Danny Garcia. Cage connected on a frog splash, near fall, Garcia kicks out. So Kill Switch, he was upset because he didn't get the job done for his father. He took off his armor. Daddy Magic comes out. He attacked from behind. Shayna Wayne gets involved. She tried to slap Matt Menard. He cut her off. And then he brawled with Kill Switch to the back. Cage, meanwhile, tried to spear Garcia. The, the leg gave away. He was selling the leg, which was the story for him in this match. Garcia hit a snap pile driver. For a two count. Garcia hit a jackknife pin. Cage got to the ropes to break the pin. Shayna then took the referee, who was Aubrey Edwards here. Nick Wayne flew in with the cover. Cage hit the kill switch and got the victory one, two, three. So they're leaving it up if they want to go back and visit this. And they do want to give Danny Garcia another championship match with no outside interference they possibly could. But the numbers game, Jesse, was too much for Danny Garcia. And Christian Cage wins... Like he usually does, man. Like an honorable man with the entire patriarchy out there having his back, he retains the TNT title. You know, you know what I like? I, I like when I got to hear people say, oh, AEW should stop using so many WWE guys, you know. And AEW, they need to build new stars, you know. They need to build their own new stars. Oh, I don't like this Danny Garcia guy. What the fuck, no? They are clearly making an effort to build a new guy who's not a WWE guy, and you don't like the guy who can clearly go in the ring. I ah, just don't fucking like him. Well, sometimes it's just no making everyone happy, dude. Um, and you know what? The fans like him. The fans love what he does. They love his in-ring, and they love his good. dance. No matter how silly it looks, it's over. It's over. He's good. Is he great? No. Is he a main eventer right now? He's no. not a bad promo. No, he's fine. He's... he's He's in a good spot. Is man. he small? Is he is he is he built like Roman Reigns? No, he's not. No. Not many people are. But yeah. if we'll you guys there. are gonna be blind and ignorant to upcoming talent that look like Danny Garcia and not give them a chance based on who based on their looks, you're just as worse as the past administration who always shit on people that look like that. That's not the time and age we're living in, man. That's fucked up. Let the guy work. Let him do his thing, man. Give the guy a fucking chance. You don't know him, you're not familiar with him because he's not someone that you are aware of, because he hasn't been through WWE and everything yeah. else. So I don't like him. That's why That's why you don't see your new stars, right? Because people don't give other guys a chance because they're not familiar with them. I'm not saying he's a superstar right now, but not everyone can be a star at the same time, man. Let them develop. I like watching guys get better rather than like, hey, this is a top guy. You got to like him. Why? Because he's a top guy. No, I want to see him. He's going to earn my fucking respect like that. I yeah. don't I don't work like that. Yeah, you know? Hulgrim said the best way to describe Danny Garcia right now, the current incarnation of Danny Garcia, is that he's the new Fandango. Now, I, I could see the similarities there, but Danny Garcia is a much better wrestler than fucking uh, Dirty Dango. Uh, but I could see the similarities, but the difference is Hulgrim and, and the people that might have compared him um, outside this comment, if you guys were thinking the same thing. You know, Vince looked at Fandango and he didn't understand why it was over. Fandango got himself over and the crowd took to him and Vince didn't like that because it wasn't on the itinerary of things to do. That's the difference between Tony Khan and Vince McMahon. Vince wanted to push this guy but didn't understand it and didn't understand why the fans loved it and he killed it because it was too over or more over than he wanted it to be. Tony Khan allowed Danny Garcia to do what he needed to do to try and get a new audience behind him. He did, and Tony Khan's letting him ride the wave with it, and it's working. So the difference between Tony Khan and Vince McMahon is Vince will kill it if it's not what he wanted, and Tony's going to let his talent do what he needs to do to get over. 
There's the difference. Yeah. If you don't understand that, I don't know what the fuck you're watching. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really see Garcia as a as um any kind of relation to Fandango. The Fandango was a lot more comedy. I mean, a lot more comedy yeah. than, than Daniel Garcia is. Um, even though he does this little dance, it's not like he does it to the point of nausea, like like Fandango. It wasn't like his whole gimmick. The guy does it for about two and a half seconds. And then maybe during like a one spot in the match, and that's about it. Fandango yeah. did it to the cows came home, man. It's not the same thing. And yeah, Daniel Garcia is a much better wrestler than, and it's not to say that, you know, Fandango is a bad wrestler. It's just Garcia is just that damn good. He's yeah. really good. Yeah, Christian Cage, the career renaissance that Christian Cage is on, I mean, that has to be stated, uh, is uh, a thing of beauty. You know, he he's nearing 50. He's in his late 40s, and he wrestles like he just turned 30. I mean, his work rate is fucking incredible for his age. You don't see many people his age fucking going in there wrestling 20 minutes against somebody like Danny Garcia, who is, you know, in some circles on social media, one of the best technical wrestlers in the world today. And he's, and he's very high on people's lists as one of the best young pro wrestlers in the industry today. But Christian, the body of work that he's doing at his age, man, cannot be overlooked he has been incredible his gimmick no matter how many times i hear him use the same shtick about you know somebody's father being dead or bringing up somebody's personal life it may be cheesy to some to me i find it to be entertaining and i have yet to fall into that category of all right man enough is enough i'm not bored with it i love it i love that he riles people up in that fucking nasty vile heel way and he's brought prestige back to the championship. And I wonder if he actually spoke to Tony Khan and said, Tony, listen, give me the TNT title. People are talking about it not being prestigious or a joke title. Let me hold on to it. Let's do away with this fucking open challenge shit. Let me run the gauntlet with these young kids first. Beat them and bring some prestige back to the championship. Bro, he's done. You check off things that Christian Cage has done, man. It, you'll be here all night long. Fucking fantastic work he's done. Yeah, I want to recall back to um, his debut where he, you know, got a bad rap because yep. of the way that he was unveiled. and Which was mainly then, Tony Khan's fault. It's my, uh, uh, 100% Tony Khan's fault. Yeah. And he, he got a bad rap, and everybody brought into question what he was actually even going to bring to the table since this overhype of a debut and what it, I mean, if it was even worth the signing at all. And maybe, you know, we were a little bit guilty of it as well because we were all kind of salty about how it all went down, and it wasn't punk. You know, but my God, he has proven us all wrong. He yeah. is worth every goddamn penny he is being paid, and he's probably deserving of more. Um, he's been great. He's been an unexpected, you know, breath of fresh air. I have zero complaints about what he's doing. This this heel gimmick is is just killing the business right now, as far as the um, top heels in the company. And bringing in Copeland only made it that much more intense. Yep. And then when he starts going into his field with, with others about his, you know, about his role model of being a father and their father being dead, it always hits close to home to a lot of people because it's like it's that's such a personal dig. And then look at everyone else. He's sh he spit that shit to most of them have all end up joining his fucking stable. Yeah. So, I mean, it's 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 interesting. It's a it's a low blow to someone. And then we don't know if they're going to end up in his stable or end up just getting run over by his stable. Um, his stable is not anything like if, of major impact. You know, he got Mama Wayne, he's got Little Wayne, and you know, and he's some got, fucking he's guy like, in a dinosaur mask. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, but it, it's just he's just so visceral with his fucking promos and his head games, and it's so fucking interesting and everything else, man. I'm enjoying everything Christian Cage is doing, and I am so glad that he decided to come over here full time. I'm yeah. enjoying. All of it. Love it. Shout out to Christian. We love Christian and uh, looking forward to what he's going to continue to do with that TNT title. Yep. Eddie Kingston, he defended the AEW Continental Championship. They call it the Continental Crown Championship. I don't think we need to uh, accentuate the title any more than it needs to. Continental title against Brian Danielson. The story here was basically these guys have history. And my cat's crying because my door is locked and she's meowing. I don't know if you guys can hear that. I'll let her in in a second as, uh, let me get through this. Uh, Why are you locking the fucking door? Because she's sleeping on the fucking couch. She fell asleep during Sting's match. 
So why are you locking the door? Because I got my other cat now, Freddy, f walking around. He can't be interrupting the stream now, you know? Um, oh, God, dude. Against Brian Danielson. The story here was that Eddie Kingston wanted respect. And he wanted Brian to shake his hand. That's all Eddie Kingston wanted. He, he stated that he doesn't, he loves the fans, but he does not going to look for, to, towards the fans for respect. He wants respect from the boys. That's what's going to make him sleep easy at night. Brian continued to disrespect everything about Eddie Kingston, the way he looks, the people that he idolized, the way he looked up to uh, Jun Akiyama and, and all these Japanese legends. So Brian Keith got an AEW contract. That was what started this all off here. Brian Keith, he shook Eddie Kingston's hand. Eddie Kingston had a match with Brian Keith for the Continental Championship. He unveiled the All League graphic at the end of the match. Shook his hand. Brian came out during this moment and kind of shit on Brian Keith. Took it away from him. He, he interrupted the moment. And, and Eddie, Eddie Kingston was like, what the fuck are you doing, man? What, what, what type of disrespectful prick are you? Then right. Brian wrestles Jun Akiyama. They have a decent match on collision. Eddie Kingston's on commentary. After the match, Akiyama uh, wanted to uh, shake his hand. Brian would not shake his hand and eventually did and then gave Jun Akiyama a low blow. That started a brawl, and we all know that Eddie Kingston's mentioned uh, his name a ton of times as talking about Japanese influences, uh, and uh, Brian disrespected his idol. So we're, we're here, and, and we've seen these two wrestle before, whether it's in eliminator tournaments, whether it's one-on-one -on -one for no reason, whether it was in the Continental Classic, which was great in itself. Man, oh man, out of everything that these two have been a part of, this was easily the best match between Eddie Kingston and Brian Danielson in an AEW ring. This was fucking great for the Continental title. And I hope that they do right by the Continental title and they just don't throw it into the international title realm where it's defended against nobodies and no story behind it. The little story that we got here, man, I'm hungry and thirsty for more. This was a fantastic fucking match. This was great, man. Brian, Brian is at his absolute best. Absolute best rare form when he's working heel against his friends. And there's just there's just a level of trust and chemistry that you can just see in the matches where he's working with one of his good friends. Um, they become stiffer because again, that level of trust. You don't want, I mean, you find yourself, you don't want to hit someone as hard when they're not a friend of yours, all right? I mean, there, there is a level of, you know, professionalism, but when it's a friend of yours, you feel freely to beat the shit out of them because you know they're going to give it back to you and the match is going to be that much better. I see all of that chemistry when I see Brian and, and Eddie Kingston work. And all of that came out tonight, the stories, the way that Danielson um, stomped on the side of his fucking earlobe and everything else, the chops and the no sell spots, it all made sense. It all flowed all because of the story. And, and if you watch, there's a promo that, that um, Brian did in the back in the trainer's room I with saw Eddie. I saw it. Yeah. It's great stuff. I thought it was going to be, you know, a moment and it was a little bit at the moment of a hit. Hey bro, hug it out. You know, I just wanted to bring out the best of, uh, out of you. And you did, it was a little bit of that, but at the end of it, Eddie Kingston left the trainer's room and, and um, Brian just kind of turned to the camera and was like, oh, well, you know, it's a great match, you know, uh, but I fucked him up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I take great pleasure in fucking him up. Yeah, I was I like, fucked him up. Boy. It's like, <laughs> I know you like Brian Danielson, too. I know he's one of my favorites of all time. What do you think, Eddie Kingston? Huh? You got any more to say to my fucking audience? Oh. Holy shit. Go to bed. You already fell asleep during Sting's match. <laughs> Leave that damn cat alone. Jesus fucking Christ, man. Uh, this was yeah. this was great. Love this match. Easily the best thing that they have done together. Don't know where they go from here with Brian. Um, I don't know where they go with Eddie Kingston, but uh, this was uh, a title match that this title itself desperately needed. And the fans loved every bit of this. Um, we'll pick it up midway because th they, they went over 20 minutes. Easy. Um, yeah. Kingston... Drove Danielson down with a DDT before locking in a stretch plum. Kingston's arm was weakened. At one point, he knife edge chopped inadvertently the steel post. There was a lot of knife edge chops here. Oh. Eddie Kingston was knife edge chopping the shit out of Brian Danielson. They were on the apron at one point. He knife edge chopped the steel post. So yeah. that's what happened there. 
uh, with the arm and with the hand, which obviously Danielson tried to exploit in this match. Kingston was there in the middle of the ring. Uh, he had the stretch plum, and Danielson escaped. Danielson then avoided a half and half suplex, connecting with some corner drop kicks. Vicious. Kingston sidestepped the third, so Danielson planted him with dragon suplex. Kingston constantly fought out of the corner until Danielson hit a corner drop kick and an avalanche butterfly suplex into a submission. Kingston got to the ropes to break the hold. So anvil elbows from Danielson. Kingston fought out of a regal plex, hit a spinning back fist, and a northern lights bomb for a near fall. The anvil elbows, by the way, um, Kingston was basically being lit up. He his eyes were wide open. You fizz the camera work during this match was great. Yeah. Um, you saw Kingston's eyes just wide as the anvil elbow started, and then all of a sudden he just flopped like a fucking uh crash test dummy. He was absolutely out. So the anvil elbows were beautiful there. Um, he gets the near fall off the northern lights bomb. Kingston hits another back fist, and that was with his bad arm. So he did not get all of it. So Danielson absorbed it, punted the arm, and hit the Busaiko knee, goes for a two, and Danielson couldn't believe that Eddie Kingston kicked out. So Danielson started hammering away down boots, which looked vicious, right across Kingston's face, locked in a triangle, and Kingston faded, but he raised his hand up and got to the ropes. Kingston started absorbing more kicks. The yes kicks, by the way, correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, or the chat. Uh, Danielson was not doing the whole yes uh, set up by pointing the hands in the air. Now all of a sudden in this match he started doing it. Did you notice that, or did he? Has he, he started, been? Has he been doing that? He started doing it when he turned heel. Okay. He started. Of, of, he started course, of course he did. Yeah, he started doing it when he went heel. <laughs> <laughs> what a dick. I'm like, uh, is he is he going to get sued by uh, Titan Tower? I don't know, man. But I don't know. Listen, he. I I believe I believe he just can't say yes. Uh, uh, WWE can't. Patent finger fucking yes. point. Yes. Okay. That, yeah. That's that's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yes. Away. Finger point away, Brian. I love it. <laughs> yeah. The crowd is saying yes. He has no idea why they're saying yes. He's just fucking pointing. Okay. So um, he he started doing the uh, he got the busaiko knee. He couldn't he couldn't believe it. So um, at that point, um, both got to their feet after uh, both men had collapsed. Trading half and half suplexes. Um, they got to their feet and swung wildly with slaps each other. Danielson backdropped out of a power bomb, tried for the Busaiko knee again, but Kingston hit a lariat. High stack power bomb, and literally, I, I didn't know this was going to be the end of the match, but it ended the match. The high stack power bomb was it. Uh, Post match, Danielson kept faking a handshake. Ultimately, they showed respect uh, to each other. Kingston uh, had his hand raised by Brian. And uh, the crowd chanted Eddie, Eddie after Danielson left the ring to Kingston all to himself. So that was the match. And I thought what they did was fantastic stuff. The story here with the hand and Kingston fighting from behind, earning Brian's respect, taking literally every dose of offense that Brian has in his bag of tricks. Just a fantastic match. One of the best matches of the night and the best match between these two in AEW. Yeah, man, that there is, dude, there is not much more to say about this match. It was absolutely fantastic, you know. Um, the story behind it, the story behind it was just so simple and to the point. Yeah, and it was effective, though. I mean, I, I think between um the whole BCC and these guys are all besties beyond besties. If you guys are unaware, they have been doing fantastic work as far as getting Eddie Kingston over. Now, I don't want to say over because Eddie Kingston has already been over. All right. That's not even that. But there's a quite a few a bit of naysayers out there about Eddie Kingston and his in-ring work and his look and his shape and everything else. And the BCC, you know, between the tournament and Brian and everything else, they've been putting their boy over, man. And he's been looking great in these matches and looking like a champion. And I think that's the goal they wanted to accomplish. As he was already a champion, he's already over. They want to make sure that he looks like a real fucking fighting champion. Well, and that's and that's what he looks like. I'm loving Eddie Kingston's work and everybody involved in making him look as good as he does. Eddie Kingston's probably going to take that championship into the next tournament when it happens at the end of the year. I don't see him losing that championship anytime soon. Why fucking not, man? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. 
Great match. Great match. And we take that one and move on to the next. We have what was supposed to be Meat Madness. It now turns into an all-star scramble match with the number one contendership for the AW Championship on the line. I didn't know what the fuck a scramble match was going to entail. I didn't know how to win it. I didn't know if it was a battle royal and people get thrown over the top top rope or if it was just a free-for-all and somebody gets a pin and that's it. But that was the way this match ended. So we had Powerhouse Hobbs, Chris Jericho, Wardlow, Lance Archer, Hook, Brian Cage, Dante Martin, and the guy, Jesse, that everybody paid a ticket to see, my guy, all the way from Mexico. Yes. The ratings draw. Putting asses in seats. Magnus. Woo. Magnus. Man. Who? I'll tell you right now, my pick to win this match was either Magnus or Dante Martin. One of those two. Magnus. Ultra Magnus? Who? What, what's his name? Oh, it, it, he's an Autobot. Right? What, what, is that? Is that? Is, is a Transformer? Was Magnus an actual Transformer? I think so, right? Was he? Probably one of the new generation ones or something. Who the fuck know? Who's who? <laughs> what is this guy doing in a championship contender match for the biggest title in the company? Who did he beat? Please. And no, I didn't watch Collision on Saturday because I was at House of Glory. I watched. So at least it. I have an excuse. Sorry, I was calling a Mustafa Ali match against Alex Shelley, which was, by the way, awesome. Oh, I bet it was. Who did this guy beat? Mustafa, he's gonna fuck around and and send his henchmen after you, man. It's Mustafa. It's Mustafa. 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 Mu- like mu- like mu like a cow moo. Mustafa, keep it up, man. Mustafa. His campaign. He will take his campaign Mustafa. as far away from House of Glory as he possibly can. Mustafa. Is that the way he said? Mustafa. 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 Listen, man. I got a fucking Bronx accent, man. I'm sorry. Some things are hard to articulate. I'm sorry. You got people around me saying bagel, bagel, <laughs> water. Like, like I don't, I don't say things the way that they should be said, man. Seriously. Look, us Chicagoans, we're not gonna, we're not gonna rip you for your for your dialect. Between you and the Boston's over there, y'all sound the same to us. Nick Aldis. That was his. That that was Nick Aldis, right? Magnus. That was his name. Was it? Oh, I think that was one of his uh, original. This guy yeah. was not Nick Aldis. I'll tell you that right now. No, not quite. No, 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 no. no, no. Anyway, enough of the joking around. Tony Khan loves his uh, walking into rent rental lucha days. Man, he loves to pick out his uh, his favorite mask. You know. Um, listen, I know this was supposed to be Meat Madness, and we like Wardlow. We want Wardlow to work out. We do. We've spoken highly about Wardlow. None of this is Wardlow's fault. It's all on Tony Khan and his uh, <laughs> writing team. But I said to Jesse, I'm like, hey, this was predictable. Uh, there's nobody in this match that was going to win this but Wardlow. And, no. <laughs> and, and, and we said it. Yeah. I, we said we said two weeks ago, Jesse. It's like, all right, Wardlow clearly is setting his, himself up for a championship match. He wants a championship match. That's what he wants. How do we get him there? We got the rankings, yeah. and Tony Khan put him in nothing but one minute jobber squash matches. And then we said, all right, listen, if you want to get the point across, when this guy finally gets a championship match, I'm going to look back at all these fucking sixty second squashes and ask. Who has he beaten to become number one contender that we can realistically say, Wardlow is the guy. He's deserving of a championship match. Nobody. So he puts him in this match. And yeah, Hobbs is in there. Hobbs is great. We love Will Hobbs. He's a name. You know, Jericho's in there. Lance Archer's on TV once every fucking 365 days. Hook is in there. Brian Cage is in there. Uh, Ultra Magnus is in there. And Dante (laughs) Martin is in there. So some of these names don't mean anything. Some of these names are fucking jobbers. And some of these names, like Jericho, are not. But Wardlow wins this thing. Are you looking at him now as the number one contender? Do you really look at him as the number one contender for the AW World title after winning this match tonight? How do you feel about it? I'm going to say yes. Because um, first and foremost, who else is there? Who else has more momentum right now than Warlow? With the way that Warlow has come out and established that he's tired of being screwed over, 
and and he you know he's a big dominant fucking meaty man and he's in his new faction and he won this scramble match who else has um main you know main event number one contender momentum right now Nobody. i can't think of anybody else so um i mean it pre- should it should be jay white but I mean, that's, a, that's, white. A, that's a different story it will be Okada. We got Osprey, who's in there. Had a tremendous match tonight with Takeshita. There will be names. Adam Cole's hurt. MJF is out. Omega yeah. is out. So if Warlow's going to be that name right now, I guess he's the best that they got under the current situation oh, that they're in. Exactly. Now, if for some reason, if for some reason, if Takeshita had beaten Will Osprey in his debut match, I'd be sitting here saying that Takeshita should be the number one fucking contender. Yeah. You know, I mean, stranger things have happened. Nobody expected him to win, and he and he did not win. Had he won, I'd be saying maybe Takeshita. But right now, it, I mean, looks like Wardlow may be in the spot to be to be ex- an acceptable number one contender. They still have a little ways to go to make me believe that he's gonna be the world champion, though. Yeah, we're not there yet. I can just or see him in a match, you know, it, it feels like he has earned a main event match against the world champion. They got a little bit ways to go to make me believe he's going to win it. Yeah. Uh, this match was uh, chaotic with eight guys involved, uh, as you would expect. But uh, I don't know who from AEW is watching us tonight. Um, you know, I'm not a producer. I'm not an agent. I'm not a creative writer. Uh, but I have a problem with what we watched here in the first, uh, I would say, five to seven minutes of this match. And I would really love somebody's answer on this because this is a pet peeve of mine ever since I started watching professional wrestling in my adult age, okay? Clearly, clearly, there's eight guys, so you know it's going to be chaotic. But I would really like to know why we didn't save the meat part of the match. Pause. The meat part of the match towards maybe the end when everybody was basically uh, kind of uh, running on empty. Yeah. What happened in this match was everybody got involved and we got the meat madness match. It's like they wanted to go right to the meat madness part of the match uh, in the first two minutes. So Wardlow takes Hook and throws Hook over the top rope onto onto all the other smaller guys, the non uh, factor guys in this match. And all it was was a a, a gorilla press over the top rope and uh, they were all laying on the outside. Literally for five minutes as these guys had meat. Chanted at them by 16,000 people for five minutes. These guys had to sit and watch and pretend to be out or injured or what I like to call and what Jesse likes to call sleeping. They took a nap on the outside and watch these guys go for five minutes in the ring by doing absolutely nothing. How ridiculous does that look? Now, obviously, the fans watching on TV didn't see it. But the people watching there in the arena front row, they're looking at these guys probably watching this match or hook. Worse yet, selling a fucking move that uh, move. We, we've seen. We, we saw Takeshita kick out of a hidden blade at a one tonight. I mean, give me <laughs> yeah. a fucking break. <laughs> Meanwhile, Hook is on the outside selling a gorilla press onto three other guys. Why didn't you save one. that towards the end of the match? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So, 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 some of the terminology that you know we like to use around these parts. So, if you're if you're in a big match like this with multi men and everything else, you're and you're not involved in the focal the focal point of the match you're either sleeping or dead yeah and you don't want to be sleeping and at the beginning of the match one spot and then you're just out for that long while they get their meat spots in you're just fucking sleeping on the outside this this mostly happens at royal rumbles and battle royals and shit so what happened to darby later on darby fucking you know went through fucking glass and like six chairs now Darby was out of commission for a long ass time. Why? Because Darby was fucking dead. And he, I mean, he had a reason to not fucking get up. All right. These guys, one spot and they're out for that long. They could have just had a match, did their big spots, beat the crap out of each other and did their meaty men spot much later when everybody had the crap beat out of them and they couldn't get up for a while when they actually died. They were just fucking sleeping. And that's, that, that is a pet peeve. Like, we were looking at Warlow at one point because the camera was right there. Like, what is he doing? He's just laying there, hanging out. You should be competitive as fuck. You're talking about you want to be world champion. You're sitting there being lazy. That's what it looks like. We understand that he has to wait for his spots, but it shouldn't be that way. 
When they do that shit, they should be out legitimately. Knock them out, chair, something. Do something to make it look like they have a reason to be laid out for three, four minutes. Yeah, this was uh, this was terribly produced. Awful. Uh, this was the worst match of the night. Um, and, and listen, it's going to happen with these chaotic eight-man, uh, multi-man matches. So after the meat stuff got out of the way, they threw their weight around. People were loving it. Shoulder tackles. Each guy, the bigger guys in the match, tried to take each other off their feet. Crowd was chanting meat after every shot. Pause. Uh, so after the meat battle took in, uh, or uh, ended, I should say, Jericho jumped in. Code breaker out of nowhere. Hook broke up a pin. Uh, so with all these guys out, Jericho, Hook, Martin, and Magnus finally got into the match. There we go. They jumped in, and uh, Taz, I had to write this in here. Taz called this a mini-meat battle. Yeah, mini-meat. <laughs> pause. Mega pause there, okay? Jericho opted to leap off the rope. To the outside on Hobbs. Martin wiped out Wardlow, Magnus, uh, and everybody else on the outside. Um, he actually took a nasty bump off this dive, Jesse, to the outside. He uh, clipped the top rope on the way down, almost fucking crashed his head on the apron. But yes. you know what? The young kid, he fucked up the move. Clearly, it was a botch. He gets right back up. He goes back into the ring and does a nice crossbody on Chris Jericho, pretending and almost kind of deflecting the move uh, that he did previously. So he kind of brushed it off. So that's a nice yeah. professional move there, man. He didn't acknowledge it. That's fine. I mean, yeah. look, he's he's a high flyer. Does shit go wrong sometimes? Yes, it does. Yeah. All right. He had a little flop dollar moment. Got back on his fucking horse and kept on going. People will give him a little shit here and there, but no one's going to look at him twice. He's, you know, it's fucking Dante fucking Martin. bro. Yeah. You know, more often than not, he's going to pull that move off, you know, without a hitch. And it happens. All right. Not a big fucking deal. Oh, speeding things up here. Hobbs was in the ring. He leapt back into the ring. Mowed people down. Dropped Archer with a running power slam. Martin with a uh, slam as well. Cage took out Hobbs. Brian Cage, that is not Christian. Or Christian, like uh, Nigel McGuinness loves to say. Uh, uh, Cage took out Hobbs, leaving himself and Hook to square off. Cage delivered a short arm lariat. Wardlow took turns, hitting German suplexes on everyone. Looked for a powerbomb on Cage, but Hook sank in the red rum. Wardlow was fading. Jericho applied a lion tamer at the same time. Cage broke it up. Hook hit a northern lights on Jericho for a two count. And then he was pulled to the outside by Hobbs, who hit the world's strongest slam on the outside. Hobbs charged at Jericho, who took, I don't know what the fuck this was. There was some sort of smoke machine on the outside, and he took the smoke machine and the liquid yeah. and threw it in Hobbs' face. So he was blinded. Back inside, Cage spun out of a power bomb but was leveled by Wardlow with his wind-up lariat. Wardlow hit the power bomb, but Martin nearly stole the match with a roll-up. Martin hit his nosedive on Archer. He was taken out of midair by Wardlow, who also fought off Hook at the same time. He took Hook out with a wind-up lariat, and he dropped Dante Martin with his last ride powerbomb to become the number one contender. So Wardlow is now the number one contender for the world championship. Adam Cole walked out there or was wheeled out there by the Undisputed Kingdom. I hope soon he starts walking. But the story here is Jesse, and um, Mr. Baydala and myself are on a spaces tonight, and this was brought up in the discussion uh, earlier tonight on X. We all kind of figured Wardlow was going to win this match. And if you guys remember, Wardlow was looked at by Adam Cole when Adam Cole first unveiled himself as the devil, and then we got those promos citing their mission statement and what they plan to accomplish in AEW, right? The kingdom is holding the tag team titles in Ring of Honor. Roddy's going to win the international title, which he did tonight. Adam Cole's going to win the world championship, or Wardlow's going to win the world championship, but he kind of alluded that it's going to be his because when Wardlow wins it, he's going to give it to Adam Cole. Now, Wardlow looked at him like, oh, yeah, bro, all right, whatever the fuck you're talking about, man. Go back, to, go back home to Brit, man. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> but um, he won this number one contendership, Jesse, is it likely that we see Wardlow now forced to give up that championship opportunity to Adam Cole? Do you see that being a factor in this storyline now, now that the Undisputed Era is slowly starting to uh, gain more power here, and now they ha hold the keys to the uh, AEW championship? Well, they, they, so they have one of two options. They can um, pro, you know, give us what they alluded to, and that's that confrontation of Wardlow you know, being expected to give up the title. Or they can pretend it never happened and then go in a different direction. You know, we're not gonna forget that it happened, that, no. that that Cole said it. 
So that's going to require some kind of payoff. Um, he just didn't say first, it. He said it two weeks in a row. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But first, Wardlow needs to win the title. You know, we got to start there. So is Wardlow going to become world champion before Swerve? No, probably not. I mean, I don't think so. Uh, I saw Hooligram ask, he, he said, um, how is Swerve not the number one contender? Um, Swerve was number one contender, and he just lost. Yeah. So, so technically, it's back of the line. Even if it's not back of the line, he is not in front of the guy who just won a number one contender's match. So technically, he's behind Wardlow, if anything else. But um, he just had a shot. You know, you don't get to keep getting shots until you win. You know, you got to technically go back to the back of the line. But with the ranking system, when they put that back out, I see him being right under Wardlow for not being the one that got pinned. Yeah. Now, we don't know how Wardlow is going to factor into this. Is Wardlow going to get the shot against Samoa Joe at the next pay-per-view? They have, you know, six weeks of build, yeah. which we'll talk about in uh, a little bit because they did announce it later on in the show. Uh, I'm actually excited to see what AW television looks like when there's not 10 weeks of fucking build in between pay-per-views. We got five weeks, six weeks of pay-per-view between this pay-per-view and the next one which is a positive with AEW going to more pay-per-views monthly instead of every two or three months, every four months. But I could see Wardlow getting the shot at Samoa Joe at Dynasty in April. It would be two heels. Joe would probably be a tweener. But I don't really see that being the main event that they expect it to be. Do you see him getting a shot at the pay-per-view, Jesse? Or do you see it maybe being something that they play off on Dynamite, and we get Samoa Joe wrestling somebody else, a little bit more main event worthy at the pay-per-view. Yeah, I, th I think they'll blow this off on TV somewhere. Yeah. Um, maybe even uh, in Boston. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a you know, big show coming up, um, you know, a, a big uh, big named uh, show, two weeks. Uh, we have number one contender, Wardlow. He's not going to win, but they can play off their story, you know, and proceed to the next uh, contender at the pay-per-view. So, yeah, I, I would see him getting that shot at, um, at um, in Boston. I, I think that's the the way that they're going to go. But uh, we will see. Yeah. The Wardlow dynamic now is a little interesting. And I want to give him a shot. I don't really trust creative to do the right thing. But we will see how this all plays out. Is MJF going to be a factor? Do we see Wardlow and MJF aligning up again like they were in the beginning stages of AEW to maybe battle the Undisputed Kingdom because Adam Cole tries to fuck Wardlow over? I don't know. I don't know if MJF is going to factor into this. How Swerve is going to factor into this? It's going to be um, MJF interesting. MJF is MJF is not resigned. He's negotiating with WWE. <laughs> sure, thing. okay, sure thing. Just, I'm just saying. International Championship, Roderick Strong. Ah, yes. He defeated Orange Cassidy tonight to finally become the international champion. Uh, I thought this was uh, a decent match. Nothing to write home about. I'm not going to be ranting and raving about how great this match was. The one thing I did like about this match, Jesse, is the fact that the commentary team, and we've been through this song and dance before with Orange Cassidy, how many times can he defend that title and still win and walk out as champion, right? The injuries are mounting, and commentary made it a thing tonight that he's running on fumes, and how long can he maintain this pace the one thing that I noticed about this match, man, two things. One, Roddy was vicious. And number two, man, we got not Adam Roddy. We didn't get the jokester Roddy, man. We got the fucking Messiah of the backbreaker Roddy. He dissected and fucking broke down Orange Cassidy tonight and won the match. Not only the title, but he won it decisively. And that's exactly what AEW needed to do tonight. And they did the right thing. Yeah, we got undisputed era Roddy, man. Yeah. He's in rare form, mm -hmm. right? and so and that, that's a beautiful thing to see. And um, and getting KO back. Um, spoiler alert: we got Kyle O'Reilly back. Um, I don't know what 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 path they're taking to reunite these guys. Fine, I'm I'm here for it. But at the end of the day, Kyle O'Reilly will be with Roderick Strong and Adam Cole. Um, whenever, however they get there, that's where he will be. Yeah. And I see that faction being much stronger once we get Adam Cole healthy. And we get Kyle O'Reilly uh, integrated here. Um, I'm seeing I'm seeing the Undisputed Kingdom do big things coming up this year. Yeah, I, I like it. We'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, Cassidy was dissected here, man. He was he was beaten up pretty badly. Roddy basically owned most of this match. 
multiple bad, uh, multiple backbreakers. Cassidy tried to fight back. Uh, he had bad ribs here, and Roddy just kind of maintained that damage on the back and on the rib area. There was a top turnbuckle spot here where he did a gut wrench backbreaker on the top turnbuckle, which looked like an incredible spot. Uh, that took uh, Orange basically out of the match. Strong started to mock the little kicks that Orange does before unleashing devastating chops. Strong connected with another backbreaker. Cassidy comes out of nowhere and hits a stun dog millionaire. Uh, desperate stun dog millionaire. He was unable to follow up, though. Roddy locked on Stronghold. Cassidy got to the ropes. Strong caught a boot and planted Cassidy with another backbreaker before getting Stronghold applied again. Cassidy kicked out, and he hit the Around the World DDT before going to the top and hitting a diving DDT on Roddy for two. Cassidy started to ramp up. He started to build some momentum here, and he started using his kicks and then connected with a beautiful-looking Panama Sunrise on Roddy for two, which is Adam Cole's signature move. Roddy countered an orange punch, turned it into a backbreaker, hit a rising knee. Cassidy came out of nowhere with an orange punch, followed by a beach break, but Roddy got to the ropes to break the pinfall. Cassidy took too long to go for another orange punch. Strong came back with a knee strike and finished it with the end of heartache, his lung blower finish, and he wins the international championship, and it was absolutely the right outcome. At the end of the match, Mike Bennett and Matt Taven hit the ring to celebrate and hoist up Strong on their shoulders, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we got Kyle O'Reilly appearing from behind, and he looked a little different, Jesse. Longer hair, little, little scruff on the face. He looked like he put on some muscle. Some people on social media were like, uh, were like, uh, oh, it looks like Roddy did, or uh, Kyle rather didn't get sleep for like three weeks. Yeah. Uh, I mean, listen, Roddy's always looked like that. Roddy has gone through extensive surgery on the neck and he's uh, battling diabetes. I'm just happy he he's really? fucking. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck? Really? Yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ. Uh, he, um, I'm just glad that he's back. I, I don't know what the uh, status of him is. But there is an update, and I'm going to give you guys some news on Roddy here. This is courtesy of Sean Ross Sapp and Fightful Select. They actually have news on Roderick Strong, or uh, Kyle O'Reilly, rather, and the segment with Roderick Strong. Uh, they say there were times during Kyle O'Reilly's absence where the company operated in the possibility that he may never come back from injury. However, in late 2023, Fightful were told that he was optimistic of a comeback. O'Reilly showed up with a new look, and they are told that there are other elements that will be different for him in this run. Manny had expected him to be a part of the Undisputed Kingdom reveal, but a different direction had been in the works for months. Several viewers saw O'Reilly traveling into town, and word of his return was known within AEW, but some thought it would happen further into March. Despite the rest of the Undisputed uh, era being in AEW, we're told that AEW had not reached out to Bobby Fish as of a couple of weeks ago or planned for him to come on in and rejoin the group. So Bobby Fish will not be a part of the Undisputed Kingdom. But O'Reilly, Jesse, they say that the new look and other elements that will be different for him are going to be a part of his character. That's very interesting. Yeah. But they, to be honest, they I don't see them really having a need for um for Bobby Fish right now. Um it may come to that. I could see that it could possibly come to that in a, in a little while down the road. You know, maybe when the maybe then the faction has a little, you know, separation, you know, and then maybe um, these three guys come out together and then maybe bring fish in then. But as of right now, I can see them not necessarily need him at this point. Um, it's good to have Kyle Riley back, man. Um, it's it's, it's I'm, I'm really sad to hear of that. You know, he almost didn't make it back. So hopefully everything goes smoothly for him and everything else. I fit. I think he'll fit in like a glove with everything that Cole and and Roddy are doing right now too. Yeah, uh, I don't really find it to make much sense with him being solo. Honestly, uh, yeah. I think him joining Adam Cole and Roderick Strong in the Undisputed Kingdom is the way to go. Uh, obviously, they were not going to give it to you on night one and just kind of blow through it. They're going to develop a storyline. Here yeah. And the Undisputed Kingdom can absolutely use a storyline on top of the Wardlow situation and the Adam Cole situation. Let it drag out for a couple weeks. Let's see where it goes. Let's see what other elements he does add to this run and this character. I'm glad that he's back. 
And if it uh, means Kyle is going to be back on television, I only find that to be a good thing, man. Uh, I, I love yeah. it, and I'm a big fan of what he and Roddy did specifically in NXT. I thought it was tremendous. I thought all of Undisputed Era was fucking unbelievable. So him being back, man, I'm uh, I'm excited to see most of the group back in, back in AEW because I had high hopes, and then all of a sudden it just went away. Yeah. Yeah. So we got that. And the new international champion is Roderick Strong. So good on that. Uh, we go on to John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli against FTR, Dax Harwood, and Cash Wheeler. Um, I know Jesse and I talked about this the last two weeks. You know, we were struggling to find the story here, and there was no real story outside of. The two teams feuding because Blackpool Combat Club were feuding with CMLL. They had gone away for a little bit. FTR was feuding with the House of Black. They won that steel cage match, so they really hadn't, didn't have anything to do. Now, Mark Briscoe's battling the House of Black on his own. Danny Garcia's wrestling the Patriarchy and had a match with Christian Cage tonight. So FTR didn't really have anything to do there uh, on Collision. So they called out, or Blackpool Combat Club, rather, called out any tag team in the back and... We got a feud between FTR and the Blackpool Combat Club, which has kind of developed over who's better than who here over the last several weeks of television. The problem is we have no problem with any four of these guys. I mean, they are fucking fantastic professional wrestlers, some of the best in the world. But the way I look at it is we could sit here and watch these guys wrestle all day long, but it's not going to be the same as if there was a story tacked on to what they were doing in the ring, which Jesse and I documented very well. There isn't. There is no story. So whatever these guys did two weeks ago, last week with the six-man tag, and then this, this match, it's like, how much of it can you actually care about if there's no legit story here? We, we appreciate the great pro wrestling, but at the end of the day, Jesse, we're just sitting there like, all right, what else is there? You know, it's great pro wrestling, but what more do you got for me, man? I need more. Yeah, no, I agree, man. It, you know, I, 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 I watched this match. I tried to get into it. Um, and the match went off fantastically. I mean, it went off like you would expect it to. To me, it just kind of looked like everything else they've been doing in the, in the lead up to this match. Um, the match was good. It didn't stand out for me. I don't know. If you have not watched any of like the Dynamites or anything like that, and this is your first time really seeing these guys as of late. This match probably hit you in a little bit, you know, a little bit harder than it than it hit me. To me, it just felt like I've just I've just seen this already, and yeah. I don't know where it's going or why it's happening, and it's good. I mean, but I'm I'm just bored with it. Yeah. Now, AEW's got a tremendous tag team division. Have they focused on tag team wrestling as of late and utilized the division to the utmost degree? No, they have not. I think tag team wrestling in AEW, ever since the Young Bucks have been removed of any sort of creative vision. Uh, in their EVP ro roles, uh, and Tony Khan's basically taken over everything creatively, the tag team division has suffered. You know, and, and it's not, uh, it doesn't take a blind man to see that. It's not, the tag team division and the way they handle tag team wrestling is not the same as it was in years one, two, and three. In years four and five, and Jesse can attest to this, tag team wrestling has been not a priority in AEW. And that sucks because they got some of the best fucking tag teams in the world, right? Yeah, especially when you came out in your in your you know pep rally and told us that tag team wrestling would be a focal point of yes. the organization. That is, it is not a focal point of the organization right now. No tag team wrestling. I know tag team wrestling is not the same as it used to be in AD. I know. I have, please. What else you got to say? You love FTR, right? So do I. Um, yes, it's not the same. It's not the same at all. But I said this with this match. Is this AEW maybe turning the page on how they're going to start booking tag team wrestling in AEW? Like, you got FTR, best tag team in the world. You got Blackpool Combat Club. I'd love to see more of John Moxie and Claudio. I think they're a fucking well-oiled machine, man. Yeah. They're, uh, they're a dark horse, no pun intended, in that division. They are fucking great. Are we going to get some sort of new renaissance in tag team wrestling with Blackpool Combat Club leading the charge here? I don't know, man. I'd like to think so. Maybe, maybe. Um, I'm not sure what they're gonna do with the titles. Um, if they vacate them, you know, it'd be great and set us up for a tournament, and we can start fresh. Yeah. Uh, with with fresh tag team champions. Yeah. 
That's what it certainly looks like with uh, Sting and Darby winning those, uh, winning that match and maintaining those titles tonight. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, this was a fine match. Surprised that FTR lost in their uh, backyard of North Carolina, man. And you, you stated this months ago that you had a sneaking suspicion with Pepsi Man leaving and, and getting fired that uh, FTR maintaining their stance there and, and being with the company, they haven't been in much of anything as of late, man. It's really starting to fucking weigh on me about what you said months ago when Punk got fired. It's kind of ringing more and more true, man. And Tony Khan taking these guys and having them lose in their backyard, which is something he doesn't do. Yeah, I don't know, man. That's uh, that's an eye opener. There, they kind of they lost the tag team titles with my god, it's like no fanfare, pretty much, right? No, I mean they then they, they're losing to Big Bill and Ricky Starks. Yeah, who have not been on television by the way since they've not been on TV. And then FTR just doing nothing. They're just chilling on Saturday nights, bro. Hey, uh, Cody, can you get me a ringside seat for WrestleMania 40, man? I got to be there, says Ricky Stark. That's exactly where he's going to be. Man, they are just chilling on Saturday nights, just hanging out, doing stuff here and there. They made it to the pay-per-view here to lose in their backyard. Like I said, man, um, I don't think it's Tony's intention to bury them. I mean, again, they are a, you know, you know, a phenomenal tag team. But I kind of think they are on the back burner right now. Maybe they'll be pushed forward a little bit more now that they well, hopefully, now that they're about to focus more on the tag team division. Um, but if not, and they still start looking the way that they've been looking, man, I'm I'm again, I think there's a little bit of a, a personal and you rode with this guy, now he's out of here. You guys can sit your asses in the back seat for a little while, man. That's what it feels like to me, at least. Yeah, uh, it certainly looks like that. Um, Mox and Claudio. They came out wearing LOD, Legion of Doom style, spiked shoulder pads. That was the an titles, awesome look. The titles are vacated. They are. Okay. They are vacated. I guess they were they were vacated at the scrum. Okay. There you go. We no longer have tag team champions as Sting is now retired, and Darby had to give them up because he's not going to find another partner that's not Sting. Yeah. So uh, I'm assuming that Tony Khan is going to come up with uh, his favorite national pastime, man. We got another tournament Her- happening, man. Oh my goodness. I'm here for it, man. I think it's a, I think a tag team, tag team tournament is a, is a, is a, is a good spot for that right about now. You know what? This is what, you know what? I would actually, I would actually wait on this. I would yeah. actually wait on this. I would, I would include teams from other promotions if he could. I would do a forbidden door like tournament, honestly. Get everybody well, involved. I, I mean, how, how, what kind of credibility is, are they going to have to win if they're only in to visit? If they win the fucking titles. Who cares? Who cares? I mean, it, it makes me believe that all these people coming in, I know none of them are going to fucking win. Let's uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to try and find uh, a list of tag teams in AEW, man. Do we have a list of tag teams in AEW? Uh, chat, list off some tag teams in AEW minus the two teams that wrestled tonight. Let's see. We got Private Party, right? Yeah, they're not winning. Yep. Right, we got best friends not winning. We got House of Black, put them in there. These uh, are maybe, tag teams, though. Maybe, if, the, if not, maybe, maybe if, the Lucha Brothers, right? If they have no fucking momentum right now, this tournament is where you're gonna get teams who are not on anybody's radar right now back into the momentum category. All right, listen, we got the acclaimed. We got yep. Aussie Open. We don't know where Mark Davis is if he's coming back. Kyle Fletcher's the uh, Ring of Honor uh, TV champion. <laughs> Garbage. Uh, Bang Bang Scissor Gang, right? We got Bullet Club Gold. We got Best Friends. We got Big Bill and Ricky Starks. Uh, Ricky Starks is currently on the phone with Cody Rhodes to uh, see if his uh, AEW contract could be voided. Uh, Blackpool Combat Club, Butcher and Blade. Uh, We got Cole Carter and Griff Garrison. Dalton Castle and the boys. None of these teams matter. Dark Order. Death Triangle. Pac had a video package. He's on his way back, finally. Um, we got the Don Callis family. It could be Powerhouse Hobbs and Konosuke Takeshita or Takeshita and Osprey. Who knows? Uh, a lot we, of fucking teams. we got the Young Bucks. We got FTR. We got the Hardys. We don't know what Jeff Hardy status is. Private Party. We got the Iron Savages. We got the Kingdom. We got uh, LFI. We got the Mogul Embassy. And then we have Matt Seidel. And Mike Seidel. I don't know why they're on the list. I haven't wow. seen uh, Mike Seidel in uh, fucking years. So, uh, yes, uh, th- they have teams, but, I mean, I guess yeah. we can make a tournament out of some of those, right? You can make, make a solid tournament yeah. out, of, out of all of those guys. 
are granted, yeah, most of them are 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 not gonna win. No. But at least you're dealing with contracted AEW employees. You bring your you one need of the to top tell me, man. You won't want to see you want so you won't want to see the rascals in, in the tournament, man. I, I watched them last night, man. I called their match with uh, some of our guys at Oscar. Oh my goodness, guys are fucking, incredible, right? They are fucking great, man. Holy shit, they are as good as they are. They're the second best tag team in TNA, man. But maybe some Motor bring, City Machine Guns in there. Come on, you bring these guys into this tournament, it would make the tournament fucking lit. Yes. At the end of the day. Am I supposed to believe that they're going to drop their contracts with the other organizations to come over here and be the tag team champions? No. I mean, he wants to open the door not. for fucking CMLO. Why not? Offer yeah, some, yeah, in, yeah. some impact talent oh my to come God, out there. But here's the key, man. You could, you could rent out a place for two months. Come on. Don't fucking say that. Do not fill this tournament with a bunch of CMLL guys. You know he is. Don't you, you know we're going to get Dralistico oh. and fucking Magnus in the tournament. Oh, man. my oh, God. Man. Don't. Vikingo. No, Vikingo's out for the rest of the year. Oh, he is. Yeah, he tore uh, he tore something in his knee. The guys, like, he's got a wild style, man. I can yeah. see that happening, man. Oh well, sorry to hear that. He was supposed that to sucks. wrestle the Amazing Red in Boston for House of Glory. No longer. Uh, they have plenty of teams. They can fill yeah. out a tournament. Uh, and, uh, and look, most of those teams do not have momentum, and I'm very, very aware of that. Are uh, are the grizzled young veterans signed to Impact or TNA? Yes, yes, they are. God damn it! Yes, they are. So. A lot of these teams... Impact, TNA's got a better fucking tag team division than AEW does. The tag team division is great. You know what's not great in TNA right now? The fucking the knockouts division, man. It got raided. They lost Deanna Perrazzo and Trinity at the same goddamn time. Mm-hmm. That's tough. And it is not looking good anymore. They got Jordan Grace, and she's just out there by herself, man. They're not so, getting Camille either, because Camille apparently is on her way to AEW, I think. That sucks. They need to replenish that one, man. And I wonder if that was a Scott Demore initiative to make sure the knockouts division was stacked. And right now they need to be replenished. And I don't know if anybody's running over to Impact right now or the TNA right now with the Scott Demore situation going on. I don't know. Who knows? Kind of interesting. But nonetheless, they have enough tag teams to present um, a reasonable tournament. You got to start telling the right stories leading up to it and in it to make us believe that more of these teams have a chance to win. That's the job that they have to make this tournament work. Yeah, yeah, we'll. Uh, I'm sure we'll get something on Wednesday, and, and these two teams, whatever Tony Khan comes up with, I'm sure we'll be a part of it. And uh, I know he's going to do right by those tag team titles because uh, Sting and Darby held them, and I just feel like Tony's going to be indebted to those titles now because of what happened with Sting here. But um, this match was great. 23 minutes, no story behind it, and that's all I could really say about it. It's a great tag team match. Uh, halfway through the match, Dax tagged in. He came in like a house on fire. Mox tossed him into the steps on the outside. Claudio took over against Cash again. Camera cut to Dax at ringside. All of a sudden, he was bleeding from his forehead. Dax resurfaced. He tagged back in. Claudio received uh, Dax off the ropes and power slammed him to the mat for a two count. FTR comes in. They double team Claudio. Mox comes in. He breaks up the double team. Moxley lifted Dax, and then Claudio landed a springboard uppercut. Cash broke up the cover. All four guys were down. Dax gets up, knocks Mox over the top rope. Uh, FTR sets up a shatter machine, but Claudio counted, gave Dax a giant swing. Mox kicked him and scored a near fall uh, towards the end of this thing. So that was a great double team move. The giant swing into the uh, missile dropkick. Nicely done. Moxley elbowed at Dax in the corner and then bit his forehead. Dax battled back and they gave Mox the shatter machine for a near fall. Claudio yanked Dax off of him by his legs. Mox and Dax battled in leverage for holds near uh, the end of this thing. Moxley applied a sleeper. Claudio then put Cash in a sleeper to prevent him from interfering. Uh, the referee deemed Dax had passed out and called for the bell. And the winners are Moxley and Claudio. So the ending to this thing where uh, Dax did not give up, he passed out, he didn't take a pinfall. Clearly, they uh, tried to protect FTR the best way that they could. You know, Tony Khan loves the Blackpool Combat Club, loves John Moxley. He will have a very difficult time at any time creatively beating John Moxley, Tony Khan. But, you know, again, great match. Went over 20 minutes. No story behind it. No more to say about it, really. Yeah. It's great it's pro good. wrestling. It's good. You would never put these four. You would never put these four guys in one match and the match not be good. No. It's just different degrees of how great it can be. That's it. At its worst point, the match will be. It was good. 
you know, and I feel like that's what it was for me. It was good. It was not anything below good. It was only good to me. If you loved it, I can understand why, because these guys are fucking great. For me, it's just stuff that I've recently seen, so it just wasn't hitting for me. Yeah. Yeah, the same thing could be said about the next match here. Tony Storm, AEW Women's Champion against Deanna Perrazzo. Uh, This was for the AEW Women's title. Uh, the entrance for Tony Storm was something that popped me, man. And you know, you know, man, you know, I love me some Tony time. And uh, she came out dressed in the red and black uh, shorts, and she had the jacket and the glasses and the the backwards baseball cap. I'm like, oh my goodness, man! It's uh, I'm marking out. I mean, oh shit! It's uh, it's Tony Storm, man. She went back to her roots. For this Tony match, time. Tony time again. But no, man, it was Mariah time because it was Mariah May dressed up in Tony Storm trolling us all. And my God, man, she played a fucking beautiful looking cosplay of old school Tony Storm. Yeah. After about three to four seconds, though, I knew right away it wasn't her. Why? She wasn't feeling the backside <laughs> of those shorts, bro. Oh, like, yeah. What the? I was like, holy shit. She went back to the old fucking gimmick. That's what. That ain't Tony Storm. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Something's missing back there, bro. Mm, well, listen. Yeah, Not to say that Mariah doesn't have uh, whatever she's got back there that's not working. It's, it's great. She but, ain't got uh, Tony time. No, she, it's, not, it's not Tony time. No. <laughs> no. Um, so Tony then comes out after the little troll job, and she gets her entrance, black and white, whole spiel. We got this match, and the build, Jesse. The build has been fun. I wouldn't say it's like AEW's greatest fucking work greatest story they told a simple story these two women know each other you know they got matching tattoos they told the story about why they got the tattoos and what the tattoo signified and we got Deanna Perrazzo basically saying this is not the same woman that I lived with roomed with trained with who are you what have you done with the old Tony Storm and and Tony Storm obviously with Deanna saying that week over week it was kind of mentally getting to Tony Storm, like, uh, she loves what she does, and she thinks she's the diva, and she thinks she's fucking, uh, you know, uh, Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. But those words, what Deanna said, were breaking her down, and, and she was basically telling Deanna, well, you don't think the real Tony Storm is here anymore, but I'll tell you, at Revolution, you're going to get the old Tony Storm. We went 12 minutes, bro. The story was fun, but the match, the conclusion of this feud... I don't know if it's just me, man. It did not hit for me. I don't know what it is with AEW telling a decent story with the ladies, and then when, when we get to the conclusion, it just falls flat on its face, and that's exactly how I felt this match went tonight. So a, a lot of times it's hard to pinpoint what went wrong. This was easy to figure out. This was easy. When you have the caliber of wrestlers that we had tonight with Deanna Perazzo and Tony Storm at a pay-per-view, and the match went 12 minutes? Yeah. Clearly, we can see what the fucking problem is right there. These women did not get enough time. They did not get enough time to get their shit in, to get the right pace of the match. With 12 minutes, you got to move shit along a little bit faster than what you would normally want to. Uh, they, I think they had enough story here to give us at least 20, 25 minutes of a fucking fantastic championship match, man. Yeah. And the, and you, you, the more time you give these two, the better the match you're going to get. They didn't get they didn't they didn't get enough time. Look, I'm not here to manage the card or tell you who should have got less time or what. I'm just gonna say these women needed more time. If it was if it just wasn't there, what do you want me to say? It just wasn't there. Then the match was not gonna be good because they needed more time. They they did not fuck it up. I mean, they knew what the fuck they were doing. Their chemistry was just fine. They just did not have enough time to tell a great story. Yeah, I I agree there. And and this is a problem for AEW and their creative team. I I feel that this should have been the... I don't want want to say a priority, but this should have been the moment where you got Mercedes coming on in, and and this should have been the launching point for the women's division. I I understand that you could give these women another 10, 15 minutes. We would have been here well past 12 o'clock for this show, but... And everything, you know, with Osprey and Takeshita, they needed time. And then you got Danielson and Eddie Kingston going 20 minutes. And then Moxley and the Blackpool Combat Club against FTR going 20 minutes. You know, you can't fit everything on the show. You can't give everybody, 
you know, the time to get their shit in. But it's always the women. It's always the ladies that get the short end of and the stick. You cut sick. first, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's something that is very noticeable. If you yeah. want people to start to understand and feel like there's changes happening within the company in regards to the women, but you yet continue to make the same mistakes, you know, we're going to sit here and call you out on it. And this feud, you know, it was one of the better feuds that they've told in recent memory. And then the match itself between two world-class professional wrestlers like Tony and and Deanna don't get enough time to finish their story. That's fucked up. And that's not right. The match should have went 20 minutes. If there was one match that should have went 20 minutes, it should have been this, to tell a longer story in the the ring. They they could have did 12 minutes on Dynamite, dude. they, They didn't get that. They didn't get that at all. And now I'm left disappointed with what you did to put you know, the good faith back into the division, and now it's starting all over again. Yeah. It's 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 just the same mistakes over and over again, man. I don't know what they're going to do. I, I don't know if Mercedes is going to suffer this same fate. I, I I don't think so. But, hope not. you know, with her coming on in, a lot of people are looking at her as like the fucking coming of Jesus Christ here for the, for the, for the company. But it all lays in the lap of Tony Khan. How much of it is going to change if Tony Khan's the one making the decisions? Mercedes is not going to be able to do this all by herself. Yeah. And you can't expect her to put on a miracle with a 12-minute match at a pay-per-view either, man. No. I mean, that's uh, if you get a cut time, start with a non-championship match with no feud. I mean, this... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you want to cut some time? The BCC match. I mean, you can start there, man. Well, the Battle Royal didn't need to go... For, how long did the Battle Royal go? 18 minutes or so? Was some 15 minutes? Come on. Probably, but you get eight fucking men all trying to get their shit in, though. That should have been a pre-show match. I don't know. Or well, maybe don't book ten time. matches for the fucking pay-per-view and make the shows four hours long, quality over quantity. But that I've been preaching that for fucking five years now with AEW. Nobody listens. Yeah. Of course not, man. But the match was disappointing, to say the least. Uh, it never felt like it got into the next gear at all. Uh, not that it was a bad match. It's just... Not enough time. Not enough time. Can't get into everything it. They did, everything they did was absolutely perfectly fine. It wasn't It wasn't cringe to watch. It wasn't yeah. a botch fest. They looked fantastic out there because that's what they fucking do. Yeah. Um, but when you, you limit them to that little bit of time, they, they don't have time to let the moves breathe, to, to get to, to give some high impact spots, to make us say, oh, shit, they don't have time for any of that. They have to get to the fucking gritty and get moving because they only have 12 fucking minutes. And that probably includes fucking introductions too. Mm -hmm. So we'll pick it up a few minutes in. Perrazzo slide kick Storm at ringside. Storm fought back. She trapped the ref in the corner and then mule kicked Perrazzo. Um, Storm applied an upper body chin lock middle of the ring, slowed it down. Storm put a boot on Perrazzo's head. Perrazzo tried to fight back, but Storm knocked her to her knees. Deanna then hit a flurry of strikes, which... um, I I I want to I want to say you know North Carolina was hot all night, but for this match uh, they they just didn't resonate you know with the uh, action in the ring. I don't know why. Crowd was largely quiet here uh, when Perazzo was uh, giving some offense to Tony. Perazzo hit some clotheslines and knee lift and applied a Fujiwara armbar. Storm made a comeback, landed the hip attack in the corner, DDT for a near fall. Perazzo knocked Storm to ringside, but Luther caught her. Luther's got the best job in the business. Don't don't at me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Perrazzo leapt off the top rope onto both of them on the outside. She goes back into the ring, applied a submission on Tony. Luther distracted the ref, but didn't see Storm tap out. Perrazzo released the hold and knocked May off the apron, who tried to interfere. Storm then finished Perrazzo and got the win. Uh, and that was uh, basically all she wrote. So Storm zero for the win, one, two, three, and she retains the title. Is what it is. Moving on. They need more time, man. They need more time. Maybe it changes with Mercedes coming in in two weeks. We will see. But uh, a lot of people were atting me on Twitter. JD, JD, did you see Deanna Perrazzo? Or not Deanna Perrazzo. Um, Serena Deeb and her promo from Collision. I'm like, yes, I did. I did see what she said. She mentioned that she's the final boss in yep. AEW's women's division. And I'm like, well, maybe... Maybe they're setting up Mercedes versus uh, Serena Deeb as her first match, which you're not going to get a problem out of me with that. Take my money. Holy shit. Take all my money. If that means we're getting them in the ring, it better be on Dynamite and not Saturday Night fucking Rampage. (laughs) Yeah. Saturday Night Dark. Fuck out of (laughs) here. Moving on. 
Will motherfucking Osprey against Kanosuke Takeshita. Ah, mid. Yeah, this was uh, this was overrated, man. I mean, uh, I fell asleep during this shit, man. It was so fucking boring. What are you guys doing yes. out there? How much time did they have? They had plenty of time to fucking put on a five-star match. Holy shit. How long did this match go? Let me see what these guys got. They got uh, 22 minutes. Weird. 22 minutes. Listen. Um, take, take 10 minutes from this match, and let's see what we would fucking have. Listen, in, in regards to this, uh, I put my phone down. This was the one thing I was looking forward to most on this show, outside the Sting retirement. Put my phone down, didn't tweet. Uh, I tweeted as soon as the match was over. I was writing my thoughts in the tweet while the match was, uh, you know, uh, coming to its conclusion. But we got most of this thing everybody was excited for. Will Ospreay's in AEW. Great. Takeshita, fucking great. We're, we're glad he's here. Future of the company are both of these guys. Um, I don't know, man. I, I said this on social media in, in regards to Will Ospreay. And Takeshita. Tony Khan's got the future of the company right here. Th yeah. this, th these two are, are part of the future. You want to include MJF in there. You want to include Swerve in there. You want to include Daniel Garcia in there or, or whoever else you want to put in there. Name them as long Amen. as they're a, a young up-and-comer, right? Yep. Tony Khan needs to give these guys the ball and have both of them run AEW. Two of them, at least. Will Ospreay needs to be to AEW what Cody Rhodes is currently to WWE. He's got the makeup, bro, of everything that this company needs in a top guy. Now, MJF is obviously the top guy. He's out. He's not there right now. But my God, Swerve, too. I'm not taking anything away from Swerve. Swerve's got all the ability to be a top guy. But, man, if you're talking about fucking transcending the company and taking the company to new heights, the guy that you want on the posters, the guys that you got, the guys you want in the main event, the guy that you want fucking representing the company everywhere, PR, fucking camera, talk shows. This is the guy right here, man. I'm sticking by that, man. Give this fucking guy everything you got and build the show and the company around him, man. This was the best match of the night. It may go down as one of the best matches, if not the best match of the year. And there is absolutely nothing like a Will Ospreay match, man. Fucking phenomenal. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're going to get that, though, man, because Will Ospreay's heel work is just so goddamn good. It is. I know. It's it's just so goddamn good. Plus, But, J.D., I, how do you know about Will Ospreay? Well, uh, I mean, who doesn't? I Googled yeah. it. I Googled it. I Googled it. I Googled it. But not only that, though. I think they're I think they're trying to position Swerve to be that top baby face. They clearly had him, you know, I'm jumping ahead, but they they had him reject the the, the cheating tactics, you know, of, of Nana um to the pop to pop the crowd, you know, while Heyman's out there being a dick and beating the shit out of referees. Um and it it, it feels like he's being put in that slot to be a fucking top baby face. And I think that's where they're going. I think Swerve's going to be that. They end up making him chase. He didn't win tonight. Now he's chasing that fucking title. He deserves the title. Everybody agrees that he deserves the title. Everybody wants him to be champion. And TK didn't give it to us yet. They're going to make us fucking wait. Because they want us to keep watching this guy chase. I think Swerve is the, the, the top baby face right now going forward after this match tonight. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean, I have no problem with that whatsoever. I, I was just thinking as far as... You know, the fanfare that Osprey's gotten coming on into the company, the fact that they made a big deal about him signing with the company well before he was able to make his official debut in February. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's just so much riding on this. Then you got Okada coming in, and you got Mercedes coming in. I mean, with Mercedes and Osprey, you got the male and female version of two top stars that you need to lead this company. Yeah. I mean, it's it's truly unbelievable that we're getting Osprey tonight against Takeshita in the level of match that we got. Then we got Mercedes coming on in for the women. You get Okada coming in. You got Jay White, MJF, Adam Cole, and Kenny Omega are out with injury. Oh my God. Holy man. shit. Man, it's going to be good. It's going to be real good. It's it's unbelievable, but that's how I feel about Will Ospreay. There is absolutely nothing like a Will Ospreay match. And, I'm, and I say this, and I'm not taking anything away from Takeshita. Takeshita is fucking... 
There's not, there's not words, enough words in the English language to describe how great Takeshita is. He is fucking phenomenal. The only thing I would, if he's going to be a heel, the only thing I would change about Takeshita, and he got new theme music tonight, which is great. He didn't come out to that fucking screeching, whatever the fuck that was that Don Callis comes out to. Yeah. Um, the only thing I would do with Takeshita, if he's going to be a heel, I'd heal him up a little bit. You know, a little darker of an image, have him grow some fucking, you know, fuzz on his face, you know, and, and give him, you know, a, a badass look, you know. He still looks a little too baby to me, you know. No, he's he's a, he do, he's riding with Don Callis. Yeah, I know. I he's know. a dick. That, that's it. That's it. Takeshita is full fucking blown asshole. He's riding with Don Callis, bro. Yeah. He, he, he comes out with the fucking, the, you know, the the asshole mask and everything else. And, you know, he got the, the. The downtrodden music and all that bullshit. Um, I'm not worried about his appearance when it comes to heel. And to be honest, his in ring work tells that, and Don Callis tells his promo work of it. So, I mean, I'm loving it. I'm loving everything Takeshita is doing right now. And um, I think I, I think a lot of that is due to Don Callis. He he, he gives Takeshita credibility as, as far as being a heel. Yeah. Uh, I agree there. Osprey got the entrance. Uh, he got uh, a little bit longer of an entrance. He played up to the crowd a little bit. Crowd was singing along and chanting along. They were happy to have Osprey there. Takeshita comes out. Bell rings, and everybody's excited to see this fucking classic waiting to happen. So they land a couple big moves early on. Callis is on commentary. Takeshita hits a running dive on Osprey. So it was basically Kenny Omega's uh, rise of the Terminator. He dove over, dove over the top rope. He did the Kenny dive, and Osprey, you know, is on the receiving end. And Don Callis is on commentary saying, "Look at that! He did it better than Omega." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course he did, Don. <laughs> they cashed off one of the top rope move by Osprey, then took him out with a German suplex high bridge. I thought he landed right on the back of his fucking neck. I thought it was a lot worse than it was. So. Beautiful yeah. German suplex. Don Callis said uh, Takeshita has the best German suplex in the business. Looked like it. So the pace started to pick up a little bit. They were hitting big spots. Crowd woke up. They were into everything. Ref checked on Takeshita after a spinning elbow to the side of the head. Dropped him. Fucking brutal. His hands and arms were just all over the place. Contorted like a pretzel. He pushed the referee away. He stood and hit Osprey with an elbow to the head, which was more vicious than the elbow that Osprey hit him with just moments before. Osprey fired back. He ate another elbow. He no sold that and rammed his head into the turnbuckle. Started to hulk up. Callis said he was proud of him. Takeshita then took Osprey down, cut off his momentum. He then continued to battle back and forth with Osprey. Hard hitting exchanges. Osprey played to the crowd, springboarded towards Takeshita. Takeshita caught in midair, landed a beautiful sit out power bomb for a near fall. Callis. Look, uh, took note of the crowd and uh, giving the fans, obviously, the uh, power here. They applauded both of these guys. Callis says they were standing because they were witnessing history. We got a chance to fight forever. And Takeshita blocked an os cutter, which is basically a uh, springboard cutter, if you guys don't know. He tried Cody again. Cody Cutter? Yeah, Cody Cutter, yeah. There we go. He tried again and connected and scored a two count with the os cutter. Takeshita counted, scored a near fall on Osprey. Both were down. Osprey went for her and Karana out of the corner. Takeshita blocked it. Takeshita went for a turnbuckle brain buster, but ended up suplexing him onto the top turnbuckle. And Osprey took a wild bump down onto the turnbuckle, onto the rope, and onto the mat. This guy looked like he was playing fucking Plinko with Osprey on the Price is Right off yeah. this fucking spot. Osprey comes up, bro, and basically on the lower portion of his back, on, uh, I guess Don Callis said uh, his liver. Could be his liver bruising immediately after the spot. I thought he landed on the fucking top of his head. I thought he had a broken neck. Yeah, that was ugly. He showed his back at the press scrum, and my oh man, it looked even worse. It looked yeah, it was bad. it was ridiculous. Uh, that was scary, scary, scary on that. Um, so after that, Takeshita hit a charging knee. Osprey managed to kick out. Takeshita took too long for another knee. Osprey blocked into a stun dog millionaire and a poison Rana. Takeshita spun out of a stormbreaker into a crunchy and a wheelbarrow German. Osprey exploded, hit the hidden blade. Takeshita kicked out at one. One out of the hidden blade. Let me repeat this because people were online. Oh, well, they no sold everything. Give me a fucking break. I said it to some fucking geek online. 
You're 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 complaining about a hidden blade kicking out at a one. Did you see the sequence that followed this? Who gives a shit? Everybody was on their fucking feet enjoying this, and you're complaining to me that Takeshita kicked out at a fucking one. Yep. So Takeshita hits a knee. Osprey blocked into a stun dog millionaire. Hits a poison rana. Takeshita spun out of a stormbreaker into a crunchy wheelbarrow German. Osprey hits a hidden blade out of nowhere, and Takeshita kicks out. Crowd's fucking going crazy. So after that, both men hit dueling rolling elbows. Takeshita ran through Osprey with a lariat. Osprey blocked a jumping knee, hits a styles clash for a two count. Osprey broke out of a Storm Driver 93, hidden blade, one, two, three, and that was enough for Osprey to finally put away Takeshita. A fucking classic. And you're complaining about a fucking kick out at a one. The kick out actually enhanced everything that came after it. Yeah, it gave them something to complain about. Yeah. Love it. Unbelievable match. After the match, Don Callis got into the ring. The funniest thing that happened here. I mean, everybody's giving these two guys a standing ovation. Don Callis gets into the ring off commentary. Fans immediately start booing. Right away. It's like, it's like you match. thought they were booing fucking Will Ospreay after a tremendous eight-star match. <laughs> Fuck that match. Callis is in the ring. Start booing. Ridiculous. Heat magnet is Don Callis. Love him. Uh, Post-match, Don Callis celebrated with Osprey before checking on Takeshita as Kyle Fletcher made his way to the ring wearing the ROH TV title. Osprey and Takeshita show respect to each other as Osprey and Fletcher had a face-off before hugging. Excalibur told us that Osprey will go one-on-one with Kyle Fletcher on Wednesday's Dynamite. Why? I don't know. What is Don Callis trying to prove here, Jesse, by putting Will Ospreay against other members now of the Don Callis family after wrestling the big boss of the Don Callis family and cannot get to cash that? Well, maybe it's like you familiar with a gang initiation? Yeah. You know, they kind of jump you in. Maybe that's what they're doing right here. I don't know. I think Ospreay and Fletcher are going to deliver a bang at all. I'll tell you that. I, I I could see that. Let's start with the most important thing here. Did anybody start like a hashtag or did anybody come out to Don Callis' defense when he was getting booed out there by the wrestling fans? I mean, the guy works hard. Man, he did a great job on commentary. They booed the shit out of him. And they booed him. I mean, I mean, this, I mean, come on. The guy works hard and you just go out there and you just boo the guy for what about his feelings, man? I don't know. Somebody get somebody get Rhea Ripley on the phone and let her know that Don Callis got booed. And and we need someone to come to his defense, bro. Poor poor Don Callis, man. It's 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 a terrible thing. He got booed. Fans actually booed him. Can you believe How could this you? shit? How could you? You disgusting people, man. Can you believe this shit? They booed this man. They booed Roddy too. They booed Rod- Roddy. Worked so hard, and they booed him. They booed him. That's oh. crazy. You can boo whoever you want, folks, as long as you're respectful, as long as you're paying your hard-earned money and being respectful in the crowd. You can boo anybody you want, man. Don't let Rhea Ripley and Zelina Vega ruin your fun at a wrestling show. Man, it's just terrible. And it's- and also, we didn't have anybody as bad as Maxine Dupree wrestling on this show, so it's easy. Oh. It's easy, oh. you know. She worked so hard. Oh, That's- yeah, they got places to go work even harder, man. They're called the Performance Center. And you got people like Matt Bloom and Sarah Amato and Shawn Michaels working down there, man. You got fucking Terry Taylor down there. Who else is down there? Jesus. Holy shit. Come on now. Don't boo her. Come on, guys. She, she works oh, so hard. But, but Maxine. Get the fuck out of here. You in the wrong business if you're going to go out there and not get booed. I'm sorry. Wrong have you ever business. played? Have you ever watched a sporting event and they boo somebody that doesn't make the good play? Same you're thing, nice. folks. Same thing, man. In the wrong. You know how, many, you know how many? How many years I watched Atlanta Braves games and I fucking cursed Bobby Cox out for, for pulling out fucking a pitcher or somebody blowing a set. You know how many fucking times I cursed out Mark Wollers or John Rocker? Give me a break, bro. Come on. They didn't deserve to be booed. A pro wrestler who doesn't want to get booed. Go be a lifeguard without getting wet. I want to be a lifeguard, but I don't want to get but wet. She's trying, man. Get the fuck out of here, okay. man. Yeah, I'm trying to fucking stay awake while she wrestles, too. Go get better and maybe come back in six months. 
These women blindly defend any fucking thing. I cannot believe Rhea fucking Ripley is out there like, oh my God, she's getting booed. These fans are just, uh, they're fans and they booed her. I mean, it's, they act like that she If was Nia called, Jax oh. can put it all together, man, I'm assuming Maxine Dupree could do the same thing, right? She'll be fine, dude. Come on. She'll be fine. Get the fuck. I'm going to go to the show just to boo her now. Yeah, really. The fuck out uh, let's move on here. Uh, unbelievable match. Uh, we did it no justice here. Will Ospreay is fucking the best pro wrestler in the world. Easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Samoa Joe. Hangman Page and Swerve Strickland. Triple threat match for the AW World Heavyweights Championship. This was fucking great. They had to follow Will Ospreay, but they did a very good job at uh, keeping everybody's interest because the story was there. Now, Jesse, I could sit here and say, you know, triple threat matches, they don't really uh, embody what a one-on-one match could really do in this case. But, man, oh, man, you know, I would put this up there, this triple threat match. I would put it up there against any other triple triple threat match that we've seen recently, in recent memory. And I would put it up against any one of those because of the story that was told here, man. The story of Joe being the champion who doesn't give a shit. Going up against Swerve, who wants the top spot, will do anything to get it. And then you got Adam Page playing the role of this this heel now. Is he really a heel? We don't really know. I think after tonight, it's pretty solid that he's a heel. He's, (laughs) he's, he's, He's playing the role of, I don't give a fuck about the championship. I do. I want the title, but I don't want it as much as I want to keep you away from it, man. That story tonight, gelling all those three stories together, man, made for a fucking great triple threat match. I mean, look, we always say the best heels are the ones that, that feel justified and they feel right in what they're doing. Yeah. And you can't come out and beat the shit out of a man from behind with a crutch and then just pumble the shit out of referees in a title match and then not be considered heel. You're heel. Yeah. You're fucking, you're heel. There's no more debate now. You're just fucking heel. Yeah. And we love it. So that's it's fantastic shit. Hangman is becoming hinged. He has let his desire and his fucking passion for making sure that Swerve does not become champion cloud his judgment. He's making the wrong decisions. He's not doing cowboy shit right now. He he is consumed with fucking vengeance, and Swerve has gotten entirely in his head, and he lost himself. Yep. And if, to me, it feels like that he fucking tapped out because he knew he was going to be unavailable to stop Swerve from beating Joe. So he just gave it up. I like I it. it. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that point in a second because that's exactly what I said on social media. Uh, we'll pick it up uh, about, uh, I don't know, five, six minutes in here. Joe had a STF on Hangman middle of the ring. They continued back and forth. Eventually, Joe was down and out on the outside. Hangman and Swerve battled in the ring. Hangman landed a dead eye on Swerve. Joe broke up the cover. Joe broke up a Swerve cover on Hangman moments later. And Jim Ross was on commentary, by the way. They brought him out. Good to see and hear Jim Ross. He was there for Sting's final match. Yes. Uh, Joe gave Hangman a muscle buster at one point here, 12 minutes in. And Swerve gave Joe the Swerve stomp right after that. Swerve hit Joe with the house call. Swerve eyed a kneeling Hangman here instead of Joe. And Swerve hit a house call on Hangman, went for cover, got a near fall. So Joe recovered and began kicking away at Swerve. He went for the coquina clutch. Swerve blocked it. Swerve took over against Joe, leapt off the top rope, landed a 450 splash right across Joe's back, climbed up to the top again, leapt off with a Swerve stomp on Joe. Hangman yanked the referee, but uh, he pulls him out, breaks up the count, and uh, a lot of people are booing this, and a lot of people didn't realize. Jesse mentioned to me that a lot of people uh, at this point didn't realize this was a no-DQ match, right? No fucking DQ match. It took Hangman to yank the fucking ref out. Bro, they had been fighting so long, someone should have been grabbing a fucking chair or a bat or some shit, man. They have done nothing. It took a while for them to realize, oh, shit, this is a no-DQ match. Hey, give me this title. No-DQ. Nah, in the crown. Dude. Triple threat matches are inherently no-DQ. Yep. And they always forget about that for some reason. So, at that point, he pulled the referee out. Hangman went to go grab the AEW title belt. Now, we're playing up to the no-DQ rules. Brought it into the ring. He bashed Swerve in the skull with, in, with the belt. Swerve stood. Hangman hit him again, knocked him off the ring apron. He goes out to the floor. Joe, meanwhile, recovered. He stood up. Hangman landed a buckshot lariat and then a big forearm. He covered Joe. Ref was late to the ring. 
When the referee arrived, he got a two count before Joe kicked out. Hangman was angry. Swerve landed a sky twister on Hangman and Joe in the ring to break up Joe's sleeper hold that he had on Hangman. All three guys were down, slow to get up. Obviously, everybody wants Swerve uh, to win this thing. So Nana handed Swerve his crown. Swerve wanted to win the match on his own. He threw it to the side and said he didn't need it. Joe put Swerve in a sleeper, thanks to this slight hesitation. Swerve escaped. Hangman attacked the referee again and threw him out of the ring. He just blatantly just picked the referee, punched him, and threw him out of the ring. So at this point, Hangman is just un- unhinged here. Swerve beat up Hangman against the ropes. There would be fines and suspensions as a result of Hangman's action, says Excalibur. Hangman clotheslined Swerve, but hit Joe, or but Joe rather hit Hangman with a sudden lariat. Joe then set up for a muscle bust from the corner. Swerve blocked it. Hangman then hit Joe with a buckshot. Swerve gave Hangman his own buckshot, followed by a JML driver. Joe came in and suplexed Swerve onto his head. Joe then put Hangman in a sleeper. And at this point, I'm looking at Swerve in the corner, Jesse. After uh, Joe um, suplex Swerve onto his head, he was sitting in the corner, and then he gets the coquina clutch on Hangman. And the spot here was beautiful because at this point, I think Hangman knew that Swerve was about to fucking try and break up this hold here. And he said, you know what? I'm not giving you any more opportunities to win this fucking title. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap out. And that's exactly what Hangman did, man. The story of Hangman tapping out when he didn't want to, simply to have Swerve fucking cry later that he didn't win the championship, and Hangman was responsible for Swerve not winning the championship is a beautiful fucking story, man. Yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a good reason as to why Swerve didn't win. You know, I feel like if Swerve would have had his one-on-one match, he would have been able to pull it off. But Hangman's out there just fucking hating, and he got gypped, he got robbed. He gets screwed over, you know, and and, and I even I, I said before too. I said before this, it, and they're probably gonna because I, I heard I heard through you know you guys about the rumors of Hangman probably missing the match due to personal reasons, and then he you know attacked with the crutch and he's still in it. I'm like, well, if those personal reasons exist, I can see him taking them after the fucking show instead of missing it, and that's probably why he beat the shit out of the fucking referees. Makes sense. Well, there is news on Adam Page and how the match ended. This is coming from Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful Select. Hangman took the loss tonight, and for good reason. Leading up to the match, says Fightful, and for quite some time, word was that Hangman was set to take time off from AEW. We aren't sure specifically when that starts, but it was possibly set up by him attacking the referees tonight at Revolution. Page's status for the match tonight was actually touch and go until this past week. We are told that if... He does miss time. It could be a few months. Oh, come on. After that ending, man, he's going to miss a few months. I hope everything is all right. I hope he's all right. I hope something with his family didn't happen, that he's going to be missing time. I hope all is well there. That sucks, man. It's it's a bad blow to AEW to now lose Paige for months in the middle of this hot feud. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sincerely hoping, hoping that Adam Cole coming out in a complete wheelchair is is a is a red herring and and his and his um his ankles doing much better and he come back sooner. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. That's uh, that sucks. That's unfortunate news for Adam Page, but hopefully all is well there. Uh, great triple threat match. I thought these guys killed it. Don't know where we go because Swerve obviously lost this match. He's now in the back of the line. He could lobby that. You know, Page was the one who tapped out. I didn't tap out. I didn't lose the match. He didn't pin me. He didn't submit me. We got the whole Wardlow wild card thing. Like Jesse said, we don't know if Adam Cole is ready to go or not. He wants the world title. It's going to be very interesting to see where they go with this. But, you know, it looks like Swerve is not going to be without uh, his arch nemesis for uh, a few months. It's good. That, that's actually good for Swerve and, the, the Swerve and Hangman uh, feud. Yeah. Um, the Swerve go away and come back even more pissed off. And then we can pick up that feud, you know, from where it should have been instead of that that um double count out or that um no contest match. Yep. Um we can get another actual finish cuz um I love watching these guys work, man. They they just they do it right. Yeah. Yeah, everything everything they do is perfect. Yeah. Uh AEW announced the next pay-per-view will be April 21 in St. Louis, Missouri called AEW Dynasty. 
It's going to be very interesting to see what AEW does now with shorter weeks in between pay-per-views and how they handle the build. This is a good thing because I feel like Dynamite will be a little bit more dynamic, no pun intended, and I feel like things will matter more instead of giving us fluff because they have 10 to 12 weeks to build a pay-per-view. I think they're going to get straight to the point. We're going to get shows that matter quickly and more often, and I think uh, the pay-per-view is going to uh, really yield better shows weekly, Jesse. How do you feel about that? I, I agree, man. I mean, but again, my only concern is they don't have they don't have a streaming deal. Mm-hmm. And the more you keep stockpiling these pay-per-views, the more you're asking people to pay 40 50 fucking dollars yep. for these shows, which I don't mind doing when you're doing these shows three to four months apart. But as that gap closings, you know, closes up some, you're asking a lot, man. You guys, you guys need a streaming deal yeah. soon. April 21 is indeed a Sunday. Uh, I prefer personally a Saturday pay-per-view, but what are you going to do? I also enjoy a shorter pay-per-view at three and a half hours, three hours max. But, I mean, I've been preaching to the choir about that one for five years, and here we are. Yeah. Sting and Darby Allen, main event, tag team championships on the line. They defend the titles against the Young Bucks. Matthew and Nicholas Jackson. Sting got a fantastic video package to begin this match. He was sitting in a theater watching highlights from the very beginning of his career, all through WCW, all through NWA, all through, uh, no WWE, uh, TNA, um, AEW. This was unbelievable. He was sitting by himself watching it, and then at the end of it, he got up, the credits rolled, and said, it's showtime. So we got that, and then we got the entrance, which the entrance was great. Darby got his entrance. Sting got his entrance. He was uh, led out there by his sons. One son was dressed as Surfer Sting. The other son was dressed as Wolfpack Sting. And then Sting comes out holding the dra- drag in the AEW Tag Team Championship. He was holding it, not around his waist, but he was holding it in his hand. And he comes out, and he gets the big reaction as... Seek and Destroy by Metallica played over the PA system. I loved the presentation of Sting before we got the entrance, Jesse. What would you think of the entire presentation? Man, that was that was incredible, man. It felt like someone started cutting onions in my office on me. Yeah. It was nice. Really good stuff there. They gave uh they went all out for the entrance and uh that was incredible. Young Bucks got an entrance. They were wearing these uh, these boxing-like robes. They as- uh, ascended from the depths. They had this stage that they uh, rose up from, and they uh, came out, and we got this tag team title match to begin. This was uh, all over the place. Texas Tornado Rules. So a, we got a also... a shout out for that song, man. I don't know. Metallica's not cheap. I must have TK sell out for the license to that shit. No, Metallica is not cheap <laughs> at all. At all. Uh, by the way, Man. I forgot to mention, Ric Flair came out. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat came out. There were uh, Scotty Riggs was at ringside. There were a couple other people at ringside. Lex Luger tweeted that he would be there. Apparently, he was there as well. We did not see him on camera at all. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I think it might have been a WWE thing. I think he signed to a WWE legacy deal, if I'm not mistaken. But he was there, and we got a uh, we got a couple of people there to uh, show some support for Sting. So that was nice to see. So we get Darby Allen wasting no time for this thing. He dove onto the Bucks. Both he and Sting delivered stereo Stinger and coffin splashes. Sting's sons got retribution. This was basically a four on two attack here. <laughs> yeah, they just get to beat this. This shit was out of a him. handicap <laughs> match with Sting's sons getting in there, getting some uh, shots in. So, they did a pair of stinger splashes. Sting did a stinger splash. Darby did a stinger splash. Sting sank in a double scorpion deathlock on both Jacksons. They were able to get free. Match built to the outsides. uh, Outside. Sting's sons then helped set up tables. And Sting launched both Matt and Nick into the crowd. So, back ringside, Darby Allen flew off the top of the coffin, dropped to the floor. Uh, A ladder has now been introduced and thrown into the ring. And all of a sudden... Early into this match, Jesse, Sting is pulling out two sheets of glass from underneath the ring. Chairs were set up. 
and, and, in the aisleway, musical chair style, and they place the sheet of glass across these steel steps, or steel chairs, rather. This was a death trap waiting to happen. And I'm like, is it real? Is real it glass. real glass? Real glass. So I'm your river. The last thing that I had on my bingo card for the year, man, was Sting pulling out glass in his final match. Here we are. Wow. So Sting swung bat, a bat at Nicholas, who dodged, and Sting broke another one of the. There was another piece of glass that was standing horizontally against the ring apron. Sting smashed it in frustration because he wanted so badly to hit Nick with the with the bat. So the young bucks ran for their lives. The match spilled out to the stage. Nicholas hit a jawbreaker on Darby Allen, and then uh, a Falcon Arrow off the stage through tables. So he took him out. Matthew then raked the eyes of Sting and avoided a Scorpion death drop and suplexed Sting off the other side of the stage. So Darby and Sting go through tables off the stage by the Young Bucks. So the action eventually goes back to the ring. The Bucks powerbombed Allen into the corner ladder that was set up. Allen answered with an over-the-top stunner on Nick, code red on Matthew. Allen set up a huge ladder in the ring, slammed Nicholas into the steps, climbed and wanted to dive onto the Bucks, who sidestepped Allen and crashed through the glass. So this man fucking climbed a huge-ass fucking ladder, man. One of those Jeff Hardy-like fucking infinity ladders. Jumps off this fucking thing with a suicide dower, swanton dive off the top. And he goes through the glass, man. Shattering. It was easily one of the best visuals in AEW history. Everybody's Ooh. looking around at each other like, is this guy fucking wanting to die? Does this guy have a death wish? Bro, he came up. The camera focused on his back, man. You literally saw the blood fucking oh. like like a, th a million needles into this guy's back, man. Just blood fucking surfacing to the, uh, you know, up through his skin, man. And you saw little fucking dots of blood protruding out of his back, man. I'm like, what the fuck am I watching here? It's so nasty. It was like car auto glass. When you hit it, it shatters to stop. Pieces from impaling people. Oh my god! So fucking. Was oh. it real glass? That's real glass, bro. You see Darby's back at the scrum. That's that was real glass, oh, bro. Oh my goodness, man! This guy is ridiculous. Grab me a river. Blood all yeah. Where's Jack Perry? Uh, <laughs> blood all over Darby's back. Sting was brought back to the ring by the Bucks, who was bleeding now as well. They set up a table. Bucks mock Sting's howl. They did uh, a corner kick and missed. Sting beat down Matt, setting him up on the table and climbing up the ladder that was in the ring that Darby just flew off of. Matt cut him off, and Nicholas set up another sheet of glass in the corner. Matthew powerbombed Sting off the ladder through this table. Sting got up and no-sold the powerbomb through this table. He gets up, and mm. Buck sent Sting through the glass. I mean, he didn't get up from that. So he goes through. Sting went through glass in his final match. Matthew hit a low blow. <laughs> And Scorpion death drop. Stink kicked out. Nicholas went to go grab the title belt when Ricky Steamboat said no way. He got decked by Matt. Ric Flair went into the ring to cover Sting, who was uh, bleeding profusely through the glass. He covered him, and he said, no, stop. No more. So he ate a double super kick for his troubles, as did Steamboat, who tried to jump back on the apron. Matthew took Sting and leveled him with the title belt. Again, Sting kicked out. Bucks hit a double super kick on Sting, who no sold, and rose up from the dead. He did this fucking Matrix-like thing where he was bent over, standing on his feet. He popped up like the fucking dead man, delivering a double lariat, scorpion death drop on Matt for two. Sting went for another, but Matt rolled through, and the Bucks hit the EVP trigger. Sting kicked out again. Bucks shook Sting's hand and said it was a pleasure doing business, business with him before hitting another EVP trigger. Sting kicked out out of one. <laughs> Ridiculous. Sting told them to bring it. He had a super kick, and the Bucks wanted a TK driver, but Allen flew back in, shoved Matt off the top through a table. Sting hit a scorpion death drop on Matt. Allen leapt off the top with a bloody back coffin drop before Sting sank in the scorpion death lock on Matt, who tapped out. Crowd went crazy for the finish. Absolutely fucking ridiculous ending to the show. Incredible ending to the show. Sting tried to cut a promo. Confetti was falling down from the ring. They got three minutes. He took the microphone thanking everybody. Crowd's been thanking him since March of 88 when he wrestled Flair in a Broadway draw. Sting said he wanted tonight to be a night of wrestling fans or a night for wrestling fans that they would never forget. And this will indeed be a night he'll never forget. 
Stink thanked Allen, who he knew was a risk taker the first time he saw him. Sting continued the speech, and the feed went black as Sting was mid-promo. And I got a uh, graphic on the thing that said, thank you for watching this AEW show. And that was it. Yeah. The promo, if you guys want to see what Sting said, is now uploaded on YouTube in its in its entirety. But uh, that's the way the show went off the air. Yeah, if there, there was a first only um, fan video of it. But on AEW's official channel, they put the official footage of it on the channel. This was uh, the most perfect ending to uh, his AEW run. Uh, Sting, I believe, in the scrum, someone said in the chat that this was uh, the top moment of his career, he said. And um, I I could believe that. He went out the way he wanted. He went out with who he wanted. He went out in the match that he wanted with his friends and his family there. His sons were part of the match, which had to be fucking fantastic feeling for him. Yeah. Tony Khan, I'll say it again, man, has booked Sting absolutely perfect in all of three years of AEW and gave him the most perfect send-off. And no matter what you think of Tony Khan, whether you love him or hate him, whether you criticize him or not, and he deserves some of the criticism, but the things that he does right, man, I feel like he doesn't get enough credit for, and I feel like... A lot of us, and Sting especially, owe him a ton for giving us this show tonight, this production, and just giving us Sting's retirement and making it feel like the most important thing in the entire industry. Got to give it to him. Yeah, I agree. I don't think Sting would have gotten a better send-off than this in no. any other organization no. anywhere. Um, I even tweeted out after he no-sold the table spot because I, I, I just I just felt the trolls coming out at that one. Yeah. And I'm like, right away, I want every motherfucker out here to know that Sting can no-sell whatever the fuck he wants to. He can do what the fuck he wants to as his last fucking match, leave the guy alone. Yeah. He's fucking earned it. And um, this was great, man. This was fantastic. I, I, again, I don't know if he would have gotten this kind of treatment. Has, has, has anyone seen anyone tweet about Sting's retirement? Anybody from the WWE? I don't know. Did anybody tweet out about it from WWE? I don't know, bro. That's a good question. I wasn't really yeah. paying attention, and neither was anybody else, but... Yeah, no, I, I just didn't notice anything come across my feed. I wasn't searching for anything. But I'm wondering if they were told not to. Because why wouldn't they? Why would it be, be a huge fucking coincidence if no one from WWE tweeted about Sting's final match? WrestleVotes tweeted about it. Cody Rose tweeted about it. Cody did? Okay, awesome. Yeah, he put a picture of him and Dustin. Cody together. can do what the fuck yeah. he wants, though. Yeah. But, yeah, that's the, awesome, though. That's- yeah, this was uh, an unbelievable show tonight. Like I said in the beginning, this was easily the best revolution that they've done. Might have been the best pay-per-view that they've done, and easily one of the best pay-per-views that I've spent, willingly spent money on, period, ever. Uh, Tony Khan continues to deliver on pay-per-view. I'm seriously hoping that we, from this point on, this was a new era of AEW starting tonight. I hope that everything starts to come together, cohesively starts to come together, and we get the march that he's hyped up. I hope we get it, and I hope uh, they deliver in the biggest way possible, man, because it, this year, it, it's now or never for this company, and uh, tonight was an unbelievable start for them. So we'll see what happens on Dynamite on Wednesday. We got a new logo, new set. We got Mercedes coming in in two weeks. We got Okada potentially coming in on Wednesday. We got uh, big matches signed. For the next couple of weeks, we've got a pay-per-view on April 21. So we'll see what happens, man. We will see what happens. I want to thank you guys for joining us, man. We had upwards towards 2,800 people in here on a Monday morning at 3 o'clock in the morning. Thank you guys very much for all your support. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I would really appreciate you hit that thumbs up. Make sure you guys hit that thumbs up. We got over 1,000 likes. Continue to support that way. Memberships are open. Get them on in. Follow us on. It's ready for school in the morning. Follow us on social media. I got to get ready for the gym in the morning. Follow us on social media at JD from NY206. Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Cameo, at Chi-Town, Smart on X. Go follow Jesse on YouTube as well. Click his link, his name, at the top of the description. It'll take you right to his channel. And please go check out all the other content on my channel. There is plenty of it. Let's get into these Super Chats and then get to bed. Michael Krause with a $2 Super Chat. Good Sunday, JD. Hope your weekend was going well. I had a very... Uh, a very restful weekend, I would like to say, uh, Michael, but I'm still very exhausted, and I know I'll be exhausted tomorrow. I can't get enough sleep. 
Michael also with a two. Thank you, Sting, OTS Family, JD, and Google it. Thank you, Michael. Tanmay. Tanmay's 50 months in the venue. That's unbelievable. Hello, OTS Venue. I bought the Your Go Google It t-shirt, JD. Thank you, Tanmay. I saw that. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Uh, Jamel with a 499. I'm guessing Rhea and the girls didn't see how the ECW crowd treated Cena when he went against RVD. Yeah, I mean. Can't boo wrestlers. That was guys. one of the most vile crowds in all of pro wrestling history, man. Don't boo them. They work so hard. They work so hard. Uh, Jamel with a 199. Osprey to catch the match tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Revolution, 10 out of 10 for me, says Joseph Taylor with a $10 super chat. Will versus Takeshita match. Match of the night. I was told that the EVPs don't put over anybody and only puts themselves over. Thank you, Sting, for being my childhood hero since I was 13 years old. Thank you, Joseph. The Bucks did a fantastic. Nobody wants to talk about it because they all hate them still. Yeah. The Bucks made Sting and Darby look like fucking rock stars. Yep. Vinny with a 199. Darby Allen, biggest idiot in wrestling history. Is he? Or is he doing what he loves, Vinny? Can't, Crazy, you can't man. slight Darby, man. He's going to do what Darby wants to do. He's a grown man, you know? We're just here for the ride. One-winged Will Will with 11 months. Great show. Six stars for Osprey to catch the, Love you, JD, the realist, and the best ever do this. Cheers to 11 months and five years and three months of support to you. Thank you, brother. Much, much appreciated. Twisted with 25 months. Fire pay-per-view. This was incredible. Darby's going to kill himself. Keep up the good work, JD and Jesse. I finally... Have my gold mic. Yes, you do, man. It looks very good on you. Lord J with his gold mic. Five dollars super chat. It's 5.30 a.m., but there's no way I can sleep after that. Osprey versus Takesh is my new favorite AEW match, and Sting got the perfect send-off. LFG. He did. And Osprey, I can't wait to see more Osprey in AEW. Jacob Smiling with a 19 months. Was at Revolution tonight. Was probably one of the greatest experiences I've, I've, I've ever experienced. The crowd was hot all night. Cheers to you, JD. Jacob, you picked the right show to go to, brother. Elizabeth McConkey says, thank you, Sting, with two months. Thank you, Elizabeth. J and Joe's World, the BW Lounge, Justin Phoenix, and Dougie Doug with new memberships. Adam JD519 with a new membership. Sontivia Major with a new membership. Javier Velasquez with a new membership. Hey, check it out. Thank you guys very much. What is that? Thunder? Who's that? Gonna be our next house guest. We are oh, gonna foster. That's a beautiful dog, bro. He is awesome. There you go. Are you changing the name? You're gonna keep Thunder. No, we're gonna keep his name. We're gonna be fostering. We're not gonna change his name. All right, there you go. Look at that. Fostering. Hey, fostering is a uh, a, a very rewarding thing. I will tell you that right now. Yeah, we want to adopt again, but I want to try to make sure my kids are yeah acclimated into actually helping raise the dogs. Yeah. I'm gonna foster for a little while. Thank you guys for all the new memberships. I ask all of you, what the fuck are you guys drinking tonight? Michael J with a five. Shout out to North Carolina. That crowd, they elevated an already, already amazing show. Perfect pay-per-view. Michael J, I, I, I agree, brother. Jonathan Bordeaux with the 10 months. John Moxley after seeing the main event with Darby bleeding. That should have been me, damn it. <laughs> yes. Moxley, get pissed. Moxley, Moxley loves to bleed, yes. <laughs> Mike, 43 with 22 months. This was a great pay-per-view. Now what happens to the tag team titles? Will Ospreay is the best wrestler? Uh, well, the titles are vacated, Mike, and we will find out, I guess, on Wednesday. They vacated them during the press show uh, conference, post-show conference, post-show scrum. Uh, Phantom, thank you again, brother, for the 100 in Super Chat. Mr. Unknown, thank you for the 100. Woofness Way with 32 months. Sting was the sole reason why I watched more WCW when my friends were all WWF heads. For an absolutely iconic career and perfect end. Thank you, Sting. Yeah. Cam G with a 10. Man, what a pay-per-view. What a send-off for Sting. It was incredible. Darby is still a lunatic as well, but great match overall. Much love, JD. OTS for life. Thank you, brother. Baby Shaq with 22 months. Thank you, Sting. OTS for life. JD, Jesse, House of Glory was amazing on Saturday night. Yeah, it was a very good show. It looked like the car looked ridiculous, yeah. And we, uh, we're going to be in Philadelphia, guys. We got a great show lined up for Philadelphia, April 5th, Friday, 3 p.m. Steve Macklin, hardcore match against Charles Mason. Ooh. Ali, Mus M Mustafa Ali, 
Mustafa Ali. There you go. Against Amazing Red, coming out of retirement. Oh, come on, man. And Alex Shelley versus Mike Santana. Oh. He is the Revolver Wrestling World Champion, I believe, and Mike Santana is our world champion. So, uh, a booking conundrum if I ever saw one there. Jeez. And Masha Slamovich is going to be on the show, too, man. Holy shit. You guys just stole our whole damn roster, man. What well, I hell? mean, that's Sammy Callahan, bro. I mean, so what, everybody what, loves what, Sammy. What is Sammy doing now? He's running his promotion. He's not. He's not working full time though. I don't know. I'll ask him when I see him. Yeah, man. What's going on? He does. He's not back in I'll the TNA. I'll get the scoop. Maybe I'll interview him. I don't know. Yo, Sammy, what are you doing, bro? Yeah, is, he, is he going to AEW? What's he doing, man? What's I don't he know. Doing? Shout out to Santana, man. He had a great match with. Uh, who the fuck did he wrestle last night? Oh, Penta. That's how fucking oh. tired I am. Penta. He wrestled yeah, Penta. Yeah. Could have went longer, but Alex Shelley fucked it up. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, Jose Duarte with a $10 super chat. I've been watching for a l as long as I can remember. Love you guys. Tonight was simply amazing. I will never forget Osprey versus Takeshita. Was amazing. And yeah. can we just say, Sting, thank you. I'm still in tears. Thank you, Jose. Oh, Sammy's an MLW. Why is he even fucking MLW? Uh, that is, uh, listen. He can I go support anywhere him. he wants. I support him. The BW Lounge with a 1999 best AEW pay per view in forever. Osprey versus Takesh, the match of the year contender. One of the biggest Sting fans here, and that Sting send off could have used two things Nick Patrick and Lex Luger run ins. Well, Lex Luger can't run in. Lex Luger's not running in this shit. He ain't running in nowhere, bro. <laughs> uh, David Thiering and Billy. Thank you, brother. Thank you, guys. Love you for the generosity, man. Trevor, my guy, Trevor, man. What a banger show. Restoring the feeling has never felt so good. Love both of you as always. Osprey and Takeshita had my friend and I losing our minds. Wembley 2025 and new. And we'll see, man. I don't think we need to crown him in Wembley. Just put him in the ring with Brian Danielson. Yeah. Plenty of time. Uh, Wolf Dragon Monster Den with a 10. Did Hangman tap on purpose to make sure Swerve wouldn't win? Yeah, that's the way I saw it. I, I so. thought Osprey versus Takeshita would be a draw. Thought FTR would win. Something needed to be shorter to hear Sting's speech at the end. Well, the whole pay-per-view needs to be shorter. Yeah. <laughs> Adam JD 519 with a 5. JD, Jesse, much love to both of you. JD, been listening for several years now. Thanks for all you do. OTS for life. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate that, brother. At 3.15 in the morning. Steven Brewer, thank you for the 100, man. Cy Richards, thank you so much for the 50. Appreciate you very much. Phil with a 1999. I'm proud of Sting. Getting a chance to end his career on his terms is rare. I'm glad TK gave him the platform to perform for us. Getting to see Sting four times in this run is something I'll always remember. Hashtag forever the icon. Thank you, 29 Phil. 29 and oh, He went undefeated. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Theme parks and things with Johnny with a $5 super jet. Charlotte, since WrestleMania 39, is 0-29, guys. What? Is that true? I you can't. gotta be, you gotta be ribbing me, man. There's no way that's fucking factual. Look that up. There's no way that's factual. There's no way. Stick World Mayor with 27 months. I was at Night of Champions in 2001. I watched Sting drop from the Hilo in my hometown. Was at Double or Nothing and watched his return. Thank you, Sting. Hashtag Suck It Geeks. Thank you, Stick World. Danny Bowles with the 499. Just got back from Revolution. An incredible show. Sting got an amazing send off. That he did, Danny. Hope you enjoyed it, bro. Hollywood Eric with 11 months. Celebrating my 11-month anniversary, having a Jack and Coke and Jesse's Tacos for Sting's retirement. The JD, and thanks, JD, for the shout-out. Dynamite stream. Thank you. Hollywood Eric, and thank you, brother. Thank you for being here. 50 years of rock and metal podcast with 26 months and a $10 super chat. He says, thank you, Sting. What a perfect way to end a Hall of Fame career. JD and Jesse keep killing it. OTS for life. And he says, hey, JD and Jesse, what a great show tonight. Probably the best revolution ever, J.D. I will be attending Monday Night Raw in Kansas City in April. Going to bring an OTS sign for life. Thank you, brother. Don't bring it to an AEW show. They'll probably confiscate it, but they love the Wrestle Talk signs, though. Yeah, Wrestle Talk signs are, are loud all day long. All day for Wrestle Talk, but off the script signs, forget about it. Get out. <laughs> Fuck out of here. Jefferson with a 16 months. Hi, J.D. Saw some of your hog stuff. Been loving it. Also, Jesse, your tacos are horrible. Made me sick. I'm going to have to fight you, bruh. Meet me outside. Fight me? I'll give you a refund, man. 
Jeez. <laughs> Fight about it. Fight, fight over tacos, man. Jeez. D Bestardo with a ten dollars super chat. He says, "Yo, brother, was thinking about going tonight." And when Sting mentioned his dad's passing, that confirmed my drive down from Jersey. Talk to Kingston after the show. Cool got to chill with. Good job, fellas. Awesome, a cool dude. Yeah, awesome, awesome there, Bestardo. I'm glad you made it down there, man. Uh Fantasy Kid, 1977, with a ten dollars super chat. Had a blast tonight. Thank you, Sting. Thank you, Fantasy Kid. Mr. Premium, 2002, 499. This event was crazy live and in person. Love the homage paid to the Road Warriors by BBC. Whoa. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing there, Mr. Premium? Oh, my God. Where's your mind at, man? Get it what out of the were gutter. you watching? Thank you, guys, for a great review, and thank you, Sting. And then he says a 199 Super Chat. Hash, uh, correction, BCC. My bad. Not too late. Yeah. Nope. No, nope. no, we saw it. We saw it already, brother. Too bad uh, Super Chats don't have edit. Nope. Thank you, Mr. Premium. Hollywood Eric with a $10 Super Chat. JD and Jesse and Andrew Baydala are my inspirations. I love your rants and reviews. JD, I love uh, Jesse, I love your TNA reviews. JD and Jesse, thanks for being my outlet for the past 11 months. I'll have your back always. Thank you, Hollywood Eric. Much appreciated. Emerald Lord with 23 months. Banger of a show, he says. OTS for life. It was more than a banger show, man. This was like Tony Khan scoring an onslaught of runs in the first inning and fucking won the game 28 to 1. The one run was the uh, the uh, all-star Denny scramble match with a side of bacon. <laughs> yeah. Will Chisholm with a $10 Super Chat. When Mercedes comes in, I want to see how the women's division looks after six months because we know Tony will try hard when she first comes in. But how the booking will be after the after she comes in, we'll see. I don't know, man. Uh, I think with Mercedes coming in, it's going to be a difference maker. But uh, they can't be giving her 12 minutes. You start cutting her fucking time of, of her matches, and, and you're going to start hearing about it right away mm -hmm. from her. You're going to be hearing never mind, never mind from, from her. You're going to be hearing it from fucking us, from me. Yeah. It, can't do that, man. Let, let them work. Let them work. Thomas with a $5 Super Chat. Now that Sting retired from wrestling, is there a chance to see Undertaker versus Sting at WrestleMania 40 for one more match with both of them? Thomas, I'm going to have to ask you to vacate the venue and get the fuck out, bro. Thank you for your $5. No. No, dude. No, no, I don't want to see the Undertaker in the ring, bro. No. Guys, Jesse and I did all we could tonight, man, at fucking 3.30 in the morning. Hopefully you appreciate the hard work, the effort, and the dedication that it takes to run this show on a night like tonight, man. When I should be in bed. When Jesse should be in bed. Guys, go check out the channel. New layout, as you can see. Or I have I got exclusive content coming to members um, every month. Every month, exclusive content. Who knows? Maybe a certain someone next to me will review a show or do a live stream. Who? For the members only side. Join me. Maybe. Go follow Jesse on social media at JD from NY206 at Shy Town Smart on YouTube. Go check his channel out. Make sure you guys continue to hit that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button down below of this channel. Turn on that bell for notifications. Make sure you all go check out all the other content on the channel. Thank you for the super chat love. Thank you to the 10 new members who wanted to be a part of this fun establishment tonight. Thank you to Tony Khan for an amazing pay-per-view. Thank you all the talent that busted their ass tonight thank you to the young bucks for doing an amazing job of making sting feel like the top guy in this industry and thank you to steve borden and sting for 40 years of professional wrestling aw nailed it tonight revolution was one of the best pay-per-views that the company's ever done if not the best in all five years i'm looking forward to dynamite on wednesday i'm looking forward to okada and mercedes and we'll figure it out from there. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. From Off the Scripts and the Shot Town Smart, we will see you on Wednesday. And I will see you tomorrow night for Monday Night Raw right here on Off the Scripts. See you guys tomorrow. <laughs>